This episode is brought to you by Lone Wolf Paintball. They are an amazing online supplier and have been around since the beginning of the game as Michigan's premier paintball field and paintball supplier since 1987. They are rapidly expanding into the online retail space and supplying everything you need to be the best paintball player you can be. They have got it all. Head over to lonewolfpaintball.com and shop all of your favorite brands. And they also boast amazing customer service and will have this out to you with same day shipping, which is amazing. It's always nice to know that your stuff is on its way immediately so you can start to use it that very next week in a play. Check out their YouTube, Lone Wolf Paintball, and their Instagram, at Lone Wolf PB, and stay up to date with all of their deals and sales. Play the Game Podcast is immensely honored to have them on board, and we cannot wait for you guys to check out LoneWolfPaintball.com and become a part of their community. Today's episode of PTG is brought to you by the one and only Trans Labs that brought the world two amazing products. First off, Transfuse, which is a hydration multiplier, and most recently, they just dropped Transcend, which is a nootropic energy formula. No matter what you use, when you choose Trans Labs, you are going to be boosted and you are going to be ready to charge the paintball field and win out there. With Transfuse, that is a premium rapid hydration multiplier and immunity fortifying formula scientifically designed to replenish you at the cellular level. And they use all natural ingredients in this product. We've got zinc, we've got vitamin B6, we've got vitamin C, sodium, potassium, choline, and it is an amazing way to make sure that you're hydrated and prepared to play top level paintball. When it comes to Transcend, that is a premium nootropic energy formula designed to increase cognitive performance, elevate mood and clarity while supporting long-term brain health, and it's going to leave you feeling great with no crash or jitters. It's one of the only products in the nootropic space backed by research studies to ensure the formula is correct for optimal performance. It is more potent than anything on the market, and it will keep you charged and ready to win out there. I take one scoop, but if you're stimulant sensitive, take a half scoop, and if you want that LFG dose to launch to the moon, dump two scoops in your drink and you are going to be flying down that paintball field. Comes in two delicious flavors, Baja Blast and Skittles Candy for the Transcend, and for the Transfuse, they have two new flavors as well, Pineapple Express and Hawaiian Punched. So if you get a chance, head over to translabs.com, that's T R A N Z labs.com use code play the game and you'll get 10% off if you subscribe to a monthly delivery service you also get 10% off as well so you can take advantage of 20% off on these products head over to translabs.com and give it a go what's going on ptg fam thank you guys so much for tuning into the show this episode we have patrick mckenna the offensive coordinator for houston heat he has also been the head coach of baltimore revo and tampa bay damage Pat McKenna is an awesome, awesome individual. He brings a lot of value to any team that he that he's with. We had him on one of the GOAT shows uh, last week, and he brought up a lot of great points about how to, you know, help make the show better, help, you know, with different ideas for Go Sports, for the NXL. And um, he has a lot of really fascinating concepts for yourself, whatever team or organization you're with as far as analytics and, and how to scout and um, just a lot of value in this episode. So without further ado, we're going to hop in the show. That was an insane inside move by Marcelo Margot. Great communication. And the crowd starts chanting Harmon. Great, great shot by all the guys. So Tyler Harmon saved that game. Came out with two wins. Marcelo Margot was on fire. PTG Nation. We got Patrick McKenna on the mic. Thank you so much for stopping by PTG, the official offensive coordinator of Houston yeah, Heat brother. and has been a great mind in the game who does so much in the community with the URPL and just having um, a great energy that you bring to that East Coast paintball, to Houston Heat and to any organization that you step into. So thank you so much for joining us, brother. How's it going? It's going great, Tyler. Marcelo, it's glad to be here. I'm excited to be on the show. Um, Definitely a fan, you know, not only uh, do I like the show for uh, Dude, we appreciate the entertainment, you. but I also like it for, you know, the camaraderie and the, uh, the insight into how different people look at the game and how they approach uh, the game of paintball, which is why we're all connected. That's it, man. Yeah, 100%. 
best community and and we're also super grateful that you're you're in that community actually this show kind of spawned because last week we were doing the monthly goat meeting and you came in and, and we're uh, one of the guest speakers and uh, had a lot yes, of really sir. interesting things to say about um just different ways that we can you know make our show better make the sport better um and, and by our show i mean the show of paintball you know as far as go sports um and, and it you know you i think you were, we had you on there for about 30 minutes we we're like this needs to be a whole show for for everyone to hear so um, here we are. I'm excited to kind of pick your brain and, and talk to you about some stuff. Yeah. Like I said, I'm excited to be here and excited to do this. It's a great opportunity. Great time. Heck yeah. Yeah, that was great. The goat squad meetings are always a riot. The, they literally yes. riot in there. It's crazy. It's madness. <laughs> we have a lot of fun and uh, the discord's always going crazy. But how was your weekend? Uh, we just got done with 4th of July. Talk to us about your weekend. What did you do for the 4th? So actually, uh, my wife's pregnant. So um, and both our daughters were away this weekend. So we just kind of sat back and did nothing. I think this is the first weekend, uh, cause I travel a lot for work, for paintball, for personal. Um, so we actually sat back, literally did nothing and ordered pizza. That was our, uh, that was our extent of our weekend. Watch we fireworks. Go. Um, we live on a lake. Um, so there were people across the lake were shooting off fireworks. Um, uh, pretty sure they were breaking the bank over there using their, uh, using their, uh, government funds. So definitely enjoyed, uh, <laughs> enjoyed that just sitting on the couch. And that was kind of our uh, kind of our go this weekend. Uh, what about you guys? Nice, congratulations! First off, uh, that's amazing. You. you guys are going to have another one. Do you know if it's going to be a boy or a girl yet? Uh, no, we don't know. So we're going to have a gender reveal in early August, and it depends on what weekend, depending on what uh, what he decides to do for the California event. There we go. Nice. Yeah, That's 4th awesome. of July was pretty pretty mellow for me. I mean, I just got back from Australia yesterday, landed at LAX at like 6.30 in the morning, um, and uh, drove down to San Diego and, and just hung out at home the rest of the day. Um, it was nice. It was pretty exhausted. Uh, the lady picked me up, brought me home, and uh, yeah, just had some good food, made it, made uh, some soup and, and some burgers, actually. There you uh, go. Yeah. And burgers and tots. Not bad. How good about you, Ty? Up. I saw you guys um, were hanging out with Dalton over the weekend. Yeah, his family just moved out to the Arizona area, so they came over on the day before the 4th and kind of hung out. We, you know, illegally lit off some fireworks. You know how it goes. It's just things <laughs> have to do. Had some fun and uh, and just ran around with the kids. He's got two little boys, and I got two sons, so they all hang out. We got a four-man squad that we're training. We're looking for the 5th so we can have a five-man X-ball pretty soon here and, uh, and run around and, and keep those little youngsters busy. They were actually playing some gel strike, which was fun. There you go. Um, running around, shooting some targets. And then yesterday for the 4th, we just went to this local farm. It's like this huge farm, and they just blew up some fireworks and stood in line for an icy for about an hour and a half and called it night, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's, nice, that's dude. We're, we're definitely getting old. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. exactly. That's definitely kids. getting old. I, oh. I can say that I'm yeah, lucky It was now unreal. <laughs> I can say that I'm lucky now because both my daughters play paintball now. So I'm able to go out yeah. and experience that with them. Unfortunately, um, they awesome. honestly believe that I know nothing about what I'm doing. Um, so it's definitely one of the more entertaining <laughs> things. Um, I've tried to explain to them that I've been doing this for a long time. And uh, people that get paid listen to me. And people pay me to tell people what to do. Uh, they do not understand that. I've told They're my daughter like, how to yeah, shoot Dad. properly. Yeah. yeah, they've literally told me. And, you know, uh, Yaya actually came out and helped us with one of our children events. And um, he was sitting there and I explained to him, like, they won't listen to me. And he's like, oh, they'll listen to you. And I was like, trying to tell him how to, like, run to the snake and shoot there. And my daughter's like, I'm not shooting to the snake. She goes, I'm going to go to this pen. I'm going to shoot the cross. And then I'm going to jump in. And Yaya's like, you just listen to your dad. And she's like, he doesn't know what he's talking oh. about. <laughs> so <laughs> it's definitely entertaining. Oh, they, they, they have no clue. That's how, yeah, that's how it goes, clue. though. It <laughs> yeah, it comes full circle though. There, there comes a point. You know, I, they always say it's like for the first part of a, a kid's you know life, they they believe everything the parents say, or they're all in on on what dad says. And then you know they come once they hit a certain age, it's like no, they know best. And you spend probably a decade in that phase where it's like you know they know best. Mm -hmm. Dad doesn't know anything. And then you know it does come back around. They finally realize, ah, oh, you know, I better start listening to dad. He actually <laughs> he might know what he's talking about. He has some experience here. Yeah, I, I've kind of given up at this point. I That's think awesome. it'll be maybe in their 20s that I'll be able to actually uh, teach them how to play the correct way. Right. They're yeah. just going to do whatever they want at this point. So, That's pretty how, rad how as well. How old are they? 
Um, nine and ten. Nice. Yeah, that's that yeah, age where they're they're little people. They have their own personalities. They definitely have their own personalities. <laughs> yeah, I think it probably um, goes. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I definitely say it. they have their own personalities to the point where. Um, so my uh, my bonus daughter McKenna, which is Lindsay's daughter, um, she and yes, that her name is spelled the exact same way as my last name, so that's correct. Um, she plays the back center to the Dorito side, and my daughter plays the back center to the snake side. And if we lose a side, they will refuse to go past the back center. They'll go up the middle of the field. They'll go down their side, but they will not transition over to the other side. They blame the other one for dying and that they should have been alive. And it's not their responsibility to <laughs> fix the problem. I've been dealing with this for four seasons now. That's great. And it's getting like a little dynasty. rough. <laughs> yeah. They literally will shoot. My uh, so McKenna will tell Kaylee, hey, you died. It's your fault. I'll just go through the middle. And I'm like, there's a person in the snake. And she's like, I don't care. I'm not going in the snake with them. <laughs> that's awesome. Sometimes that middle attack, though, if you do lose a full side, that's the way back in the game. They're onto something. Well, they're convinced about it because so they've now played four seasons of youth paintball. And um, they have uh, a first, two seconds, and a third. So they think for as a season rankings, right? That's good. So they think that they uh, they go. know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe if they'd listened to their father, who's in the game, they could get that you know that next level going. Um, but that's just rad that they're out there. Like first of all, yeah. you know they're they're out there, they're having fun, they're playing paintball. That's that's really the most important thing. And uh, we'll probably see them taking over in the WNXL, you know, as it progresses and and. Uh, all the ladies keep crushing it out there on the field. It's been growing and the competition has been really, really strong. You know, you watch those games and you're like, wow, we got skill sets out here and it's really fun to watch and entertaining. Yeah, they overshoot the shit out of each other. I don't know why they're so mean yeah. to each other out there. <laughs> it's, I don't know. The yeah, it's, that's I think has things. more overshooting than, than the entire. <laughs> than in the than the entire uh, NXL league combined, I think it's great. It's fantastic, but they're they it's getting they're not afraid to give it to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the girls are on just a different level. Um, you know, Lindsay and I always talk about that. So we have a lot of girls that play in our league, and I tell her with the amount of experience we have, and the talent that we have, I could easily have a an, uh, WNXL franchise within five years of a bunch of teenage girls take over. Yeah. Yeah. That's a way yeah, I mean, we'd love to completely take over. Yeah. So we'd like, I eventually I'd like to see that. I'd like to see the Southeast, like, uh, like the Carolinas, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, like this area, get a WNXL team. Um, you know, we don't have any pro teams in this area. Yeah. The closest we have is uh, Carolina crisis is like their closest um, upper level team that we have. So you have to go all the way to NRG or you have to go down to damage or the ML Kings or all the way up to, you know, uh, Baltimore with Revo or Extreme, and then all the way out to Texas. So we don't really like the middle United States doesn't really have anybody. So it's an interesting uh, situation when yeah. it comes to uh, our pro growth out here. The, the path forward is very difficult and in this area. Yes, yeah, you have to be watching the best, trying to get reps against the best in order to le learn those skill sets. Essentially, because um, they're going to show you different looks that you've never seen, and, and like go through a route or a decision that they make down a wire or through the middle, like you've never seen. So you definitely have to make sure that you're, if you don't have that in your area, you might have to travel to get those reps, but that's how, that's how you're going to get it done. And what area exactly are you guys uh, like, what's your home field for your area? Okay. So I'm out of um, Greer, South Carolina, and my home field is uh, paintball central Welford. Um, so Paintball Central has three locations. Um, give a shout out to Tyler and Rob and those guys um, and Andrew. Um, they're in there Greensboro, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. They're in um, Rock Hill, South Carolina, or I guess, yeah, Rock Hill, South Carolina, and then Welford, uh, South Carolina. So they run a really, they have a phenomenal uh, field awesome. set. They've got three phenomenal facilities. They they were the uh, original people when I had, we had the idea for the URPL. They're the original field that like gave us full reins to do whatever we wanted and to grow it the way that we wanted to with like really no oversight. And we really do appreciate their, uh, their commitment and drive to help grow the sport. Totally. Yeah. We got to <clears> dive <throat> into the URPL. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Um, cause that, that's again, you know, a big reason of, of having you on the show is, uh, we love people that are doing what you guys are doing. Tyler and I have talked about, you know, youth paintball for a long time and you guys are at the forefront of it. Um, and, and that is for the betterment of the sport, you know, we, we kind of touched on the WNXL a little bit, but you're starting to see, cause one of the big things that was holding paintball back or does hold paintball back is just the lack of opportunity for different demographics, for young kids, for women, for, um, you know, things that other sports, it, it's just, much easier for them to have access to, you know, things like BKI have done a great job of giving players opportunity to go pro. I think, you know, there's just been a lot of lack of opportunity and you're starting to see a lot of that kind of spark and, and spring up now, you know, and the URPL is definitely at the forefront of it. And, and it's, um, to me, one of the, one of the cooler things that our sport has done. And I wish there was more coverage of it. I wish there was a way we could put that on go sports. Why not? Why, why not give yeah. it to people that are already like watching paintball, you know, are there ways to, you know, get more eyes on just that aspect because I hadn't even heard of it until, um, you know, we had talked to Todd, you know, I, I hadn't even heard or, or knew what this was, was about, you know? So I, if I haven't, I assume, you know, a lot of other people haven't, or maybe it's also not meant to be directed towards people as big of fans as us too. Maybe it is the new player and, and, and maybe I'm misguided in that. Right. But, um, I just feel like the more we could do to, to showcase that the better. Yeah, so it's um, you actually brought up a good point. Is it designed for players like yourself? And the short answer is no. Um, so there already is a target market totally. that you fall into, and that is um, national tournament paintball. Um, and underneath that, you have like the regional guys and the local guys. What the URPL is, is for is to get young youth players between the ages of 6 and 10 or 6 and 15, depending on where they're at, right? to come out, learn the sport in a controlled environment, kind of like T-ball when you go out and play T-ball for the first time. You know, the coaches are on the field, yeah, the refs are there. Totally. They're not throwing people in the penalty box. They're giving them the experience of what the game is. And then I want those players to move on to go play in, you know, the CFOA three-mans or the w or the WDCPPL, right? I want them to form and play. And then eventually when they're done and their careers come to an end, I want them to have a place where they can come back and have a low commitment and be able to play paintball on a team, but not have to go out and grind and practice two times before the event or fly around the country. Just an organized version of paintball. And I think there's two people that are doing it well. I think um, Todd and myself and our team is doing it well with the URPL. I also give credit um, to the guys over at um, Blue Ridge Paintball. I think they're doing a phenomenal. They have a different version of what we're doing by doing their monthly membership. Yeah. Um, and I think that's key because the problem is, is we turn and burn people through the tournament scene and then they either run out of funds or they just get burned out of the travel or the commitment and then they're gone from our sport. And we want to find a way to retain those players for a lifetime, not just for a small part of their life. And I think that's the biggest thing. It's, uh, it's the reason you have adult, adult softball, you have adult soccer, you have black football is because you don't want to have, you know, a 10 year yeah. span and when somebody can be active for 30 or 40. Absolutely. And it's so much fun. You see, we see the videos, uh, actually PTG sponsors the URPL. So we have some PTG jerseys out there running yes, around do. and they send us the videos. They're all having the best time of their life. And then you also have like, you have the new era, but then you have the seasoned paintball player that's played for 20 or 30 years who still wants to, you know, run around out there and have fun, but not be, in the complete tournament scene and they're able to have a space where they can play as well. So it's been really cool. And where can uh, they get more details on that as well? Like a website um, that they can go to. Yeah. So you can go to uh, united recreational paintball league.com. You can go to upstate paintball.com. You can find us on Instagram at you are paintball league. Um, That's the best way to find us. Um, it, it's a great environment. Uh, so like to give an example, like when Todd came out and we were getting ready to set the West coast league up news out with the East coast event, Todd was laughing. We had um, Jake Summers, tall T that plays for Carolina Crisis, was out there playing. And on his team, yeah. he was captaining a team. On his team, he had a dude that showed up with a horizontal pod pack, okay, in blue jeans and had just found some tip yes. out of his closet. Oh, no. Same field, same game. And that's the difference. You have, I mean, I think the Crisis guys are a top five semi-pro team, even though they definitely messed up in Philly bad. Um, but you have those guys and then you have guys that are just coming out, you know, like the dude had no idea and he's gone from 
playing in our league to finding a local five-man team, and now he's playing in CPXL, which is our local uh, regional expo league here in the Carolinas. And that's the goal is to get people, yeah. to funnel people through, let them get the experience and then move on. And then when they're finished with their careers to come back and just have a nice place to play. Absolutely. They can have a brew, shoot, you know, before the game and then uh, go out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't. We, Lindsay Blue's makes it just very clear. Tends to mix well with, with. <laughs> yeah. We used, we used to allow yeah, beer in the pits. That came to an end very quickly. You can yeah. drink <laughs> off the field. Yeah. <clears throat> we experienced with the full yeah, concept totally, of, man. It, of beer flawless. league and it did, did not, did not pan out the way we wanted it to. <laughs> <laughs> that oh, was usually it. the all-star game back in the day when they had the all-star game, you got to really experience the beer league <laughs> in mm-hmm. the pro division. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, dude. That I remember a couple of them were crazy. Oh yeah, a couple of them were crazy. I, I remember 2006 was the first one that I was a pro at, right? And I I ended up getting to play by default. It was like one of the players didn't didn't show up or something, and I was there. And Oliver and Nikki Key were like, "Oh, come on and play." I didn't get picked, um, but everybody was drinking in the pits, and I remember it was just total chaos. You know, <laughs> like people were, you know, I think one year you went out there with two guns. I don't know, squirt might have been guns. Some, so yeah, yeah but <laughs> squirt guns. Dude, I went out there with squirt guns, like <laughs> legitimate squirt guns. And uh, I forget who was it. I think it was like Billy Wing or something. I don't know. He got really mad at me. And he was like, what are yeah. you doing? <laughs> he would be the one to get really mad at you for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Real, and really I was quick, like, though, let you... me live, man. Come on. Re- really quick, though. I want to kind of uh, touch back on us not being the target demographic. Um, while that is true, what I what I and I noticed the paintball community does this a lot. We need each other, Um, whether we like it or not. We need everybody to contribute. So when we have awesome stuff, I always like the pros need to be the first to know. Like at the last event, I didn't know that it was free. I think even Sunday morning games were free on YouTube. I thought they were behind the Go Sports paywall, but they were trying experimenting. You know how many views they could get if if some of it wasn't behind a paywall, et cetera. I was like, we should all know this. You know, I know we're not your target demographic. We're playing. We're probably not watching. We should know this because we have a reach. We have the ability to share. We have a, you know, maybe we have some connections that we can, you know, send that to. And that doesn't mean that every pro is responsible for doing it. Although I personally think if you really care about the game of paintball, you are, but I get it. Some players just want to be pros, show up and do their job. That's okay too. Um, But I, I feel like there you know, if there was a, a connector or some kind of network of like all the dope shit that individuals in yeah. the sport are doing so that everybody can know. And if, Hey, if you like something and you want to promote it, awesome. You know, if, if so-and-so is doing something really cool that you, you think you want to share fantastic. Right. Um, because we all do have, have that reach and we have an ability to, to help, um, you know, kind of magnify the success of, of these things. Yeah. So I want to touch on one thing you said right there. Um, about how uh, all responsibility is pros, right? Okay. To make the statement that people are just there to do their job and are not there to promote the sport is the, is is ridiculous. And that's I'm not saying that you are in that faction, but you never see the totally. NFL yeah, walking no. around <laughs> not promoting it. You don't see the NBA walking around not promoting it. I think it's us as professionals to go out and constantly promote the sport. We should be promoting on every platform that we have, whether it's personal, professional. Um, whatever business connections we have, it's our responsibility to go out and to make this better. Um, if ever, if you want to sit around and say, hey, I'm taking a paycheck and I'm not going to help move this this ball forward, then I don't think you should get paid. I think I think we should we should move those people out of the sport. Yeah, I, I agree with that, the idea of it. But unfortunately, the way the system is set up right now, the league doesn't pay, you know, in other sports, you have to show up to media day that you, you do have responsibilities because the league does compensate and you do get and generate money from the league. So without having that, I mean, there's pro players that don't get paid at all. They're paying to be there. They're a paying customer of a product, you know, they, and that's how they view it. And it, that's totally okay because it's, it's the truth. Um, but to me, it's like, okay, can you guys be a little bit flexible? Because if we want to get to the point to where, uh, you know, everybody's getting paid, these are the things that we need to do. And so, you know, it's, it's a responsibility to me. It's a response, whether I get paid or not, it's something that 
you know, for the longest time I've said, this is, this is my goal. It's a priority of mine is to help paintball and same with Tyler. That's the whole reason we, we have this show is to help paintball, you know, get, get the recognition it deserves and, and help put it on the main stage with these other sports. And I know that we can't do that without, everybody, you know, helping and contributing. We certainly can't do it as fast as we could with everybody contributing. Um, but there, there is a, there is a difference there. You know, those leagues are able to make it mandatory for athletes to do those kind of things because they're paying, you know, through TV deals and, you know, all that kind of stuff. You go through all the nuts and bolts of it, but, um, that's the, that's the hurdle sometimes that you, you get to right now, right? You have a team, um, you know, that, has players that feel, Hey, I'm paying to show up to be here. Why, why do I have to participate in this? You know, or even the players that get paid and Tyler, I'm not speaking to your team, any team, there's four or five teams that players get, get paid from an owner, right. Rather than, than a sponsor. Um, they could easily say the same thing. It's not our responsibility. Like our owners are paying customer of, of this league. So it's a hard, hard, you know, wall to break down, but we need to break it down. We really need to break it down because, the more of us that contribute to it, and you are seeing it now. I, I, our generation of pros, our era is definitely better than ever, um, as far as like social media and going out to the local field and doing clinics and being really involved. Right? It's it's getting better, that's for sure. But you see what I mean with with that that kind of there is a little bit of a separation. Yeah, I'm gonna. It's love It's just this imperative so to have the social. <laughs> I'm going to love this so much because we are going to debate yeah, let's so go. hard. This is definitely going to take more than an hour and a half. Um, okay, so you're comparing okay. sports. You're comparing sports to today, right? That's what you're saying. You're like comparing. What do you a, mean? Um, comparing you're sports comparing, to today. You're comparing us to like the NFL today. Like, like, like the requirements. Yeah, for but the what league. I'm like doing is saying, like, well, you did that. No, you did that, not me. So you, you did that. My comparison was talking about pro players, right, having that responsibility. And you said you're the one who compared it to other sports like the NFL and that's NBA right. that that's right. it's required to do. Right. It's, it is required. So here's the catch with that, right? We're talking about sports today. The NFL at one time did not have a social media budget in the 1930s, you know, when they kicked the sucker off. They didn't have one. Players had to go to lemonade stands and put their images on baseball cards and chewing gum. You know, a lot of that was self-promotion. And that's really where we're at right now. People have to go and put the extra effort in to get us to sports today, but we're 80 years behind. Technology might be the same, but we're 80 years behind on, 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 the, on the longevity of the sport. So I don't care if we don't have um, deals yet. I don't care if you pay to be in this league. If you want to consider yourself a professional athlete, act like a professional athlete, promote the league like a professional athlete, promote your team, promote your sponsors, promote yourself, but be professional. Don't Absolutely. decide because Absolutely. you're having to pay somebody a dollar to be there. Doesn't mean you do it. NASCAR has to, the drivers and the teams pay to be in the race. And that's a billion dollar industry, right? So why can't our people go out and do that? Everybody here should be required a minimum of one social media post a week. One, you know, try to get on podcasts, try to push the agenda. Like, I just think it's a, I think it should be a requirement. And I'm, and I'm completely against some stuff. You know, I don't like that Go Sports makes money on our likeliness, you know, and, and stuff like that. I'm not a huge fan of that. But at the same time, they're the only people that are taking the, making the attempt to actually promote us beyond our realm. I mean, we just set out in a field in Philadelphia when, and people are wanting to know why we're not getting paid money. Well, we have to get people to show up to that field in Philadelphia. We have to get people to log in. I think it's great that Go Sports offered a free option. Um, but I think it's a responsibility of every single player, professional player in the league to do it. And if they don't want to do it, then I think, uh, you know, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's time for that person to move on. Yeah, I can't agree with that. Although I fully agree that we should and it should be a responsibility of every, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one for me because I promote that all pros should make posts about paintball and try to push professional paintball as much as they can. But it's hard for me to tell somebody that they're obligated to, otherwise they cannot be a pro if they're not getting anything for it in return. That's slavery. You know, that, that's like, what, what are they getting in return, it, it's a, 
it's it's I mean it's not slavery. That's a pretty harsh and crazy comparison. Yeah. But yeah. it's hard to hard to force somebody to do something without like they're not an employee, you know. So how do you do that? Like, what are the what grounds can you do that on? Well, that's that. So that is an interesting point, right? There are no like grounds to withhold to the hold against people. But if everybody really wants to promote this sword and move it forward, it's something that you all have to, each individual person has to decide and go that route. Like I think, I think Absolutely. we have too many pro teams. Totally agree. I think, I think we are. We should be cut to twelve pro teams, and we should focus on those franchises. The NHL ran for thirty plus years with six franchises. Interesting. I want to touch on that? Yeah, I um, I just think it's. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I just. I, don't know. Go ahead. I want to talk about the twelve pro team thing. Um, why why do you think less is better? Um. Yeah, it's interesting. So I, what y'all, I'll explain why I think more is better, but why do you think less is better? Okay, well, I imagine you're going to say more is better because wherever there's a pro team, it promotes more paintball in that area, and then it grows paintballs itself. So that's that's the argument. I do know the argument because I've you done this. You pay attention to the show. Yeah, I pay attention <laughs> to the show, and also this is a conversation that I've had many of times <laughs> with many people in the industry about why yes. Here's my opinion, though, and it really yeah. touches on what we're talking about. If you had 12 pro teams with 10 guys, right? That means you'd have 120 of the best people in the world, not just players, but people that want to promote. I don't care if you're the best team. I care how you present the sport and how you go out and get involved with people. New York Extreme is not a good paintball team. I love those guys to death, okay? But they're some of the best promoters. They're, they take chances. They set up booths at the event. They interact Absolutely. with fans. They have pictures with kids all the time. They're out trying to grow the sport legitimately. Their entertainment that they bring on Go Sports, even though Harris is insane, it's entertainment. It's a <laughs> part of it. You know, it's great Absolutely. to watch and enjoy. I mean, I would rather have 12 teams to have better games and better matches. I mean, how many tournaments do you guys walk into, just be honest, and you're like, okay, we're going to win these two. This one's a coin flip, and this one we've probably got in the bag. You're both on top t- teams. I would you know say not what, as you know many anymore, but I hear you. Yeah. <clears throat> well, not as I many feel like the, the bottom team, league. so to speak. Yeah, because we're all yeah, in our I think, mid I think to the late bottom 30s. team, so to speak, have actually gotten a lot better. Or have you gotten a lot worse? I, we're playing the best paintball we ever have. I don't think it. I don't think the age means that we're on a decline at all. I think. I think paintball is such a mental game that you're seeing the peak performance from all of these athletes Archie's better than he's ever been Ryan's better than he's ever been you know uh Tyler I think you would say you're better than you've ever been I personally believe I am you know Mouse is playing the best paintball he's ever played um I I don't feel that the pros are declining because of age so I don't I don't know that that I totally agree with that I do agree that having games on the webcast that are you know it's like watching basketball I, I love watching the Lakers. I love watching. Well, not to, this is a, this is to that point actually. I used to love watching the Lakers. I would watch every single game that the Lakers played, but it wasn't necessarily because of the Lakers. It was because of Kobe, and yeah, that kind of lasted you know long after after Kobe retired as well. But I, I watch games because of players now. You know, so um, I love watching Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, the greats. I, I will watch those games. I love basketball. I could watch it over and over and over and over. But if it's a game of two teams that I don't really care about or one team that's playing another team that I don't really care about because it's going to be a blowout, I don't care to watch it. It's a waste of my time. I'm, I'm going to flip the channel for sure. In paintball, I feel like we don't have to showcase those, those games. So from the viewer perspective for Go Sports, I'm totally with you. I absolutely agree. But I, I think that it might outweigh the amount of players that would you know maybe not be here if they didn't have a pro team in their area especially with where paintball's at not only is it a a far-fetched dream if you don't have it around you if you don't have successful pro players in your area i feel like you're definitely not going to pursue that path you know but if you do have a pro team like level let's say you know they're they're not a a, one of the more bottom teams now what are they sitting overall i feel like they're maybe nine or ten i'm not sure Um, nine or ten but Ninth or tenth, they're they're right there, right? Um, so not a great example right now, but even just a year or two ago, that team has given that whole region a lot of hope, you know, and and has made a lot of players in that region um, excited to go out and grind weekend after weekend after weekend because hey, you know what? They can become that. They can 
you know, they have a path that they see. They have pro players at their local field every weekend that they see, you know, and then they see them on the webcast. No matter how good or bad they do, they see them there, right? And and the professional announcers are are saying their names. They're they're glorifying them in a way. So I, I feel like that for now, maybe it, maybe one day it won't be that way. Maybe in an ideal world, yeah, you just have like 12 really dumb, I don't, I don't know. But for now, I feel like that kind of outweighs you know, having games that aren't really fun to watch because, you know, again, it's about having players, one, want to play the sport. That's the first thing. Get people to play paintball in the woods or wherever it is. And then for, for you know, our side of it, have them kind of transcend into tournament paintball. And why pursue tournament paintball if you're not trying to be a pro? I don't, I don't know that there's, you know, I guess there are older players that do do that. They, they say, you know, I know I'm not going to be pro. I just have fun doing it with my friends. But for the most part, I think a lot of the, especially the youth, they do it because they're trying to become pros. So is that because they they have a pathway to a professional player that they've met, talked to, or a team that plays in their region? Or is it simply because they turn on Go Sports and see it? I, I don't know the answer to that. You know, it's a, it's a genuine question. But I feel like there's a lot of value in having these pro teams in those regions for that reason. I mean, I, so that's, one of, that's just the argument, right? I, I still think turning on Go Sports and watching 12 mm-hmm. pro teams – that are really good and are going to, it's like Sunday paintball from Thursday to Sunday, right? That's outside people. That's what they're going to enjoy. Okay. Um, but mm-hmm. you did mention something that was inter- entertaining. Uh, you said that like you use level, right? As an example. Okay. And you said like how mm-hmm. good they look on ghost sports and stuff like that. I have a question. You th- use if they're enjoyable today, but if you watch the games when they first got in the league, except for the aftermath game at Vegas in 2020, when the score was like, 14 to 12 or something. I don't know how they were scoring that many points. It's still this yeah. <laughs> um, besides that match, yeah. right? Like, if right. they hadn't progressed to where they're at now, would, would you still be watching them? No. Well, yeah, but that, that wasn't my point, though. I think I, I said that. I did agree. I said, you know, not as good of a point now because now they are competitive. They were one but of the teams that weren't very competitive, right? But, but I'll tell you one of the reasons why that they're so popular. It's not just Go Sports focusing on them because they're doing good, but look at Die. If you look at Die just two years ago, they had flyers for level. Now they have reels and shorts. They're putting energy and effort. So it goes back to our original conversation mm-hmm. is if you put in the effort, whether you're paid or not, because those guys are not paid, that's what actually promotes you. You don't have to be good at paintball. To you don't have popular. to convince me of that. Yeah. Yeah. You you yeah. don't have to convince me of that. Again, like morally, I I agree with you. Morally, we're on the same page. Like, you know, and, and how I how I personally feel. But as far as again, like, do I think that you have to or you can't be in the league? I, I don't know that I can personally say that I agree with well, that. That that's all yeah, I was saying I there. That. Don't mistake yeah. it for me not agreeing that you're right, that that's what will grow the sport, you know? Um and and as for level and the the conversation of the top twenty teams, I mean what did we just say? NYX is one of the most like entertaining teams and yes. they're definitely not in the, in the, in the top 12. So we wouldn't have that team in our league. Is that, so, I don't know. Is that so good for the sport? Is that so bad for the sport? Uh, that's an interesting point. When you pick the 12, do you pick the best 12 or do you pick the most um, meaningful 12? Like you want to get rid of Thunder. Thunder mm-hmm. controls an entire mm-hmm. region. It's so like, and Thunder is entertaining totally. to watch. They play a different style of game than we all play. And we've all suffered to that game in this mm-hmm. group. Like they will get you one day or another. Absolutely, so, they will. So, I mean, they will get we've you. We've all like no sure. matter how much we've we've looked into them, we know exactly what they're going to do. We literally can pick out what they're going to do. Like we'll write it down. Like I remember before Florida, Todd and I literally wrote out their first three plays, and we Tyler, we told you guys we're like, oh, Matt's going here. This is where Corey's going, and we knew it. And they, they still they still beat us. Like so, it's just mm-hmm. you got to look at the regions and look where it's at. And, and put people in areas that would be more, like, better. Like, so when you talk about teams and regions and how it promotes, let's talk about Infamous. Travis has done a phenomenal job with Infamous, right? I think we all can agree with that. Like, on marketing, building the Big team, time. having all the stuff. Like, he's done a phenomenal job, okay? Where does Infamous practice? Texas. Where are their players at? All over the United States. Travis lives in Detroit, or in the Midwest, as far as I know, right? Um. But they have a Wisconsin infamous. They have a New England infamous. So does it really matter if you're in the area, if you do a good job promoting it? 
Like they have yeah, got to get to that level. Totally, totally agree. Yeah. So and, like, you know, I always do compare it back to like myself Rip, real quick. Sorry, Pat. I, I do always compare it back to myself when I was a kid going to the local field. Like the, the main reason that I pursued a professional career was because I saw pro players at the field every weekend and they, they, you know, I would go up and talk to them. They'd interact with me. They'd let me get some spins in, you know, it was attainable. I saw them there, but there was no social media back then. So maybe that is, maybe that does replace that, you know, maybe that does replace the actual, you know, seeing them at the field and realizing this is a real thing. You know, I've never quite taken that into consideration. I do think there is still something about the presence of actually being there with people, you know, uh, let's not get too cyber crazy over here, <laughs> but with your, you're definitely right with, with social media, it's one of the most powerful tools we have as an industry, as a brand, you, for any, for anyone in any industry, as a brand, social media is huge. It's so important. Um, and so I, I, I do agree. Now, maybe, you know, maybe the league could find a way or, or go sports, you know, and all they would have to do is maybe start kicking back some, something, something from, from, from go sports, you know, since they are making money off of our likeness, something to where they could say, okay, we're going to give you guys, um, each team a hundred bucks, you know, or maybe, maybe, you know, five free memberships to give out to whoever you want, uh, you know, per event, whatever it is, something. And then they can say, but it's going to be mandatory that your team has a presence on social media and your players share and, and do stuff like that. Maybe, maybe that's the workaround that you could get to, right. But there has to be some sort of like symbiotic thing going on there, you know, to where you can, you can mandate that. And it's a win-win kind of thing where everyone is, is in on that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes complete sense. So actually, I'll uh, I'll give my suggestion then. So from Go Sports, there we go. I think uh, I I, th I don't think a finance I don't think Go Sports make enough money to financially support us. Like I understand that. Like I'm not naive, um, but I think that we all should contribute um, to Go Sports because that's our that's our outlet out, right? Um, we should be able to. Um, I think each team should give a certain amount of marketing material to go sports and go sports in return should cover each team independently at least once a year, whether it's one episode, whether it's thing, the only teams that they do or only people they do are just the top guys. I mean, that's it. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they don't do anybody else. We need to find an equal spread across mm -hmm. the board to give an introduction to each team, each organization and not their 32nd clip, you know, put, put the, put, um, uh, Mike, the coach of um, uh, the Hurricanes, put him on, on you know, or one of their players. Uh, the ML Kings get, you know, Kyle Berry knows done it before, but like there should be every year, there's 20 teams every three weeks or two week, two and a half weeks, right? There should be an episode that comes out or a podcast that comes out covering each team to keep people informed. And then the, the team should be pushing media back to them so they can share at stuff from their local fields, um, stuff from practice, things like that. So people are connected. It's like the F1 uh, racers that everybody's into on Netflix, right? You know, they just don't like talk to them one time and then you don't see them the rest of the season. They follow them constantly. There should be some type of promotional update constantly being flown. Um, that's that. The league, yeah, I have a different I opinion about. That. Yeah, The league should offer kickbacks to pro teams for every team that we bring along to the event. So if you're in an area, so your, your thing is saying that you say that the area is what a pro team in an area is keeps paintball alive. Okay. Well, it's only alive if it's justified financially. So if your area, you got, you're out in California, right? Marcelo, if you bring, let's say, mm -hmm. I mean, how many teams do you coach right now? 10, you know, got connections, coaching, assisting 10 teams. So if they show up, you should get a $50 two. credit from the NXL. You know, okay. Two. So you should get a, your team should get a $50 credit for each team towards your entry. Like your, your dynasty is physically, Connected to a team and putting it. Same with Heat. Um, I know like uh, the the Pittsburgh guys work with the um, 412 up there. Like if they go to an NXL event, they, we should get a credit for that. Why not credit the players that are incentivizing or the teams that are incentivizing the growth of the league? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't hate that at all. And I guess my, my apologies. I, I personally work with two teams simply because I try to limit it. But Dynasty as a whole, I mean, everyone has a couple teams. So yeah, probably about, you know, 10. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't hate that at all. You know, I obviously you do run into an issue of people saying like, 
hey, you guys are going to the event. Let's just say you're you're kind of under our wing, you know, and, and that's right. fudging the numbers that way. But that's right. But do it at a yeah. low, lo, such a low entry point that it really won't affect the league. Right. So like sure. if you give 50 bucks off and the average entry for the NXL is what, sixteen hundred dollars. I mean, what is that? I mean, Tom's not losing mm-hmm. enough. Tom's Tom mm-hmm. just doesn't. Uh, Tom's got to go from having a fillet to a, a ribeye or something. I'm just cut him back a little bit. Come no on, way, John. don't don't sacrifice the fillet, my man. Yeah, never. Come on, you got to get no, that I mean, Tom, rare. Tom, a little pepper yeah, sauce me for this one. But that's but that's the thing, is, right? Is there's got to be a financial incentive what, like to get people involved? Yeah. Here, what I like the most is the at the base core of the thought process on this whole thing is boosting the media boosting the players boosting the the community in any way we can and just getting creative yes. and looking for ways that we can help the fellow paintball player who wants to go out there and have a good time and also nurture that growth as well because when you get both of those turning at the same time we're going to have tremendous growth in the industry and like we we're talking about with the social medias everybody from what i can tell I mean, there's never been a day in paintball where we've had so much activity with the media. I know we had the magazines um, prior, but it's just different. It's different when everybody has a magazine in their hand. You know, it's it's uh, it's a completely different ball game with the phones. It really is. Yeah. I mean, the magazine, you had to go buy it at a store. I mean, this you just have to turn your phone on. It's right there. It's in your hand. Put a hashtag. I mean. Yeah, you guys, you, you guys do the, your own the BKI magazine. thing. You guys crush it with that, right? BKI is very popular. BKI. I mean, that's a, it's, yep. You guys are just connecting to everybody. I mean, it's a it's a big deal. Um, but yeah, you know, I we could probably go around and around about the social media thing and, the, in my opinion, about players and their commitment and stuff for a really long time. Um, you know, but honestly, what it comes back down to is is growing the sport because even at 20 teams right now, you know, or my fantasy of 12 um, – we're all going to age out and we need to be replaced. And unfortunately I know there's a lot of really talented young players between that 12 and 18 year old range, but I don't think there's physically enough to actually replace us. Like I don't, I don't, I I think somebody would have to really fight me hard to tell me that they could replace us one for one with players of your caliber at that range. Not saying they're at at that caliber now, but at that caliber in the next 10 years. I think our big push well, needs to that, be for here. youth paintball. Mm-hmm. Oh, undoubtedly, every facet of paintball that we can get heightened. But what I think really needs to happen is if you are a competitive player or someone that has a well-rounded understanding of how to play this amazing game of paintball, you need to be at the paintball fields, whether it's your local one or traveling to a new one or whatever, go to paintball fields and play and have good conversations because those are the most important details of the game. For me personally, the most thought provoking insights that, that helped me to become the best player that I could be were, was not by looking at my phone. It was by going to that paintball field, getting in the grit, getting beat up on going out there and learning the hard way and being a part of that process that that you get to have those opportunities to ask good questions. So at the forefront, we need to make sure you need as the a pros community, there though to do that. That's, and that's right. That's right. So yeah. the pros need to take it on their shoulders to be at the fields, to be going out there and having good conversations, showing their love of the game. You say you love paintball. Show me. Let's be out here playing it. Let's go, you know, have and it's the greatest time of your life. Are you kidding me? You're out running around being a big kid essentially, you know? And uh, we're the luckiest people ever that we get to play this amazing game. So, so Ty, what you're saying is more pro teams, the better. <laughs> you know, I was waiting I for Marcelo to kick it in there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's somewhere right in there's 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 both gold on both sides, you know. Yeah. Um, but Wait, we, we I... want to make sure we build a strong <clears throat> league and yeah. have great communities that are building all over the country as well. I, I, I totally agree, Ty. I, I just I feel like we could do both, Pat. I feel like we can we can have, you know, twenty pro teams so that, you know, it doesn't sacrifice what I'm saying. And then we could also put more focus around, you know, making sure that the show is as good as possible. You know, yes. again, like as far as scheduling goes, I'm not opposed. I've said this for a long time. Have the bottom, you know, Go Sports should be able to see what games get more views, what teams, just like sure. you know, this is how teams get money from the NBA and NFL, how many people tune in to watch your team play? That's, that's what, you know, that's, mm-hmm. that, this is part of the process. So 
we should be able to have those numbers. And if you're a team that doesn't get that many people watching, then you're on the, the premier field right next door, you know, on, on the other webcast, you know, and I'm, would be totally okay with that, right? Like gear the show around the most entertaining content, you know, the show and the, and the league need to do a good job of like, you know, sacrificing a little bit for one another. And, and there is a sacrifice there. Yeah. I, I know a pro team's not going to want to go and play on that field, but maybe that is, that's, you know, your, if it's all about the show, then we're going to be in a good situation, right? We, I don't think we do enough to be all about the show. Um, and there's so many ways to, with 20 teams, with even 30 teams, again, just highlight the good games. You know, and I think we kind of get that with the scheduling now, like Saturday is usually a pretty good day. You can go pretty much from start to finish and they're pretty entertaining games. Right. And obviously towards Saturday afternoon is all the like top seed teams. Um, make that be the show, right? One thing that I, if I could change something today, if I could change something today, it would be not having empty stands in the background of the go sport of games. Because that looks so terrible on Go Sports. And, you know, you can't fix that if people just simply aren't there. And it probably costs a bit of money to make the stands higher. But I was thinking, like, a lot of the angles on Go Sports, they're, they're you know, from up high looking down. And so you just get, like, the top of the bleachers. But they should have banners that go up, you know, 12, 15 feet around the field or something, you know, and then have the bleachers above that. I don't know. But they got to do something about that. Because that part to me is, like, what makes... Those games, you're like, why am I watching this game? Nobody cares to watch this game. Okay, so I actually like what you just said uh, a moment ago about um, about the the teams and playing on the premier field and playing on the, the, the pro field, right? So mm-hmm. let's combine our two theories together here. So my theory is that every player should have okay. to commit to social media to help promote the league, right? Now, social media is a trackable okay. measure, okay? Why don't we have yes. it where you compete for your social media exposure, game exposure through the season to continue to be on the pro field and not relegated to the, to the, uh, to the secondary field. The more your team does social media wise, the more players do that gets your team on there. I don't care if you're the best team, but it gets you onto that field. The, and then also you factor in should the it, viewership. Should it be... and that viewership the viewership also then goes into yeah, so the okay. first event. You have to be based on social media slash past performance, right? Okay, because it, it would take and it would take an entire season to get the numbers you're talking about. But by event two, you would be able to have numbers. By event three, and then it would really matter by World Cup, because this is also the flip side of that. Now your sponsors are going to put pressure on you. Hey, we're giving you all this paint. Hey, we're giving you these guns. Hey, you really need to push. So that combines like our two um, warring theories into one where you use social media metrics to push your team to have the opportunity to be on the pro field alongside the, the teams that perform well and have the social media presence. Yeah, I don't hate that at all. I really don't. Um, you know, again, it's about the show. Like, how can we make, how can we make the games that are on the premier, well, for <laughs> not the premier field, the, the, elite the pro field the main pro field yeah the field the go sports field i guess we'll call it um it should be called the premier field the other field why is that the premier field we're the premier field (laughs) that doesn't make any sense but anyway the go sports field should should have the best games should absolutely have the best games you know period should um i will say they've been fun it's been some fun paintball everyone like it doesn't matter who you play these days everyone is fighting tooth and nail you know, I do agree with that. Yeah, yeah, it's been some fun paintball. Yeah, I mean, you know, example like for us, our what should have been our quote unquote easiest game was a one point game with the Ironman. There wasn't a single person in the stands, but it was a very exciting game. If you go back and and watch it, and they did just release, you know, Nick Sloviak was mic'd up. It, it's entertaining. It's a good game, right? Dynasty yeah. and and Ironman. This is to your point, Pat, are one of the longest running rivalries in the sport of paintball. And so yes. while it might be a top seed versus a, a bottom seed, people probably want to watch that, right? Ironmen have a great social media presence. They have a great fan base. You know, they have a history of, of you know, and, and same with Dynasty. So, so it makes sense that that game should be, should be watched, you know, and, and people are going to want to watch that. So um, I, I like the idea of 
it being based around ratings. You know, to be on the Go Sports field, it should be based around your ratings. You know, at the end of the day, that is what is going to bring money in, ad revenue, right? We need the numbers to in order to have that. So if, if we have teams that nobody cares to watch, then that's not good, right? That's, that's all I know. If we have teams that are playing that nobody cares to watch, no matter how good or bad you are, if nobody cares to watch, that's not good. If, and also on the other end, no, ba- no matter how good or bad you are, if, if people want to watch you and they're willing to pay to watch you, amazing. That's good. That's yeah, good for the sport. That's right. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're good or bad. That's what I'm saying. If you're entertaining and people right. want to pay that money, let them be. Now, the second thing you said was about the stands, right? right? So I have a, I have an idea for the stands. Yeah, we should have. So the stands. When you watch the stands, there's only a, we can only see a, a small portion of it, right? It's usually the first couple rows that you see. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Do you agree right. with that? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Have Tom put a line outside with a sign that says "standby line." And if they have 10 open seats in that, in that area, if there's 10 people standing there, they get to get in and watch the game for free. Kick them out afterwards. Fill the stands where the viewership at home does not see empty stands. How many people stand mm-hmm. on the free so section? So I don't, I don't, so yeah, the that's the now, thing. I don't think that's a, the issue because Tom, right. But they don't, they, they still charge to sit in there. So if you have a game. Yeah, I know, I know. But of, even on the free section, even on the free section, some of these games, there's just not people there. Like all the viewers are are players. So some of those early yeah. matches, um, and 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 certainly, yeah, some of those early matches, there there's just not people there. You know, I I don't think it's about it costing. Like even on the free side, that'll be empty sometimes. You know, um, I think it's more of just angling it so that it's not in the broadcast. It would be a I mean, great that's, opportunity that's awesome. to show, you know, have ad space. Yeah, you know, and yeah. and have have ad space along those walls. It looks really professional too. Like, you know, some of the paintball parks, Paintball Fit does a great job. They have the banners across the netting, and so when they did the ultimate shootout, it looks professional. It looks, you know, you watch cornhole. Cornhole like yeah. is super visually appealing because there's they got the banners all around, you know, and like the focus is on the the sponsors, which makes you think that it's an important thing because they're sponsors, you know, not just drunk people in the stands. So I, I feel like we could utilize that space to, <laughs> I feel like we could utilize okay. that space, you know, to, to make it a little more professional. All right. I concede that point to you. <laughs> hey. <laughs> there we go. Ding, ding, ding. Nice. I, I mean, right. it was, I don't think it was a concession. I think it was, we, we kind of ping pong back and forth and got to a good, 100%. you know, team understanding. Yeah. I like hey, any, we boost these sponsors and that's going to drive more sponsors to want to get involved. They're like, I want my yes. name on the banner. Yeah. You know, totally. I think, uh, any way we can heighten the the sponsors, that's always a big, huge thing that we got to be doing. Um, taking care of the industry that takes care of all of us, you know, it's yes. all at the end of the day, yeah. paintball is one big family. We got to make sure that the whole thing's thriving and, uh, and we're moving in the right direction. Um, yeah. And, Pat, I do want to kind of touch on you coaching Revo because you coached Revo for quite some time and uh, kind of like what that experience was like. How many years did you coach Revo for? Okay, so um, I'll just go over kind of my whole pro career. So that's a little bit easier to understand. All right, where sounds I good. Go. Let's run it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so um, I I guess I'll just start kind of at the beginning. Um, so I wanted to be a professional coach. Um, I played uh, seven man. Um, in the early 2000s. And I recognized that even though I was a pretty good athlete, I actually liked the strategy of the game more. And I started developing and becoming a coach. I actually started all the way down in division four as a division four coach. And then I went all the way up to pro. So I did not play pro. I think I'm one of the few pro coaches out there um, that has not actually played pro. I I don't know besides, um, I think Paul Richards may have been, he didn't play pro and I don't know who else that, uh, you know, Jerry, uh, Dan Kensley. wake at one point. Dan wake, was yeah. A... Yeah. yeah. So yeah, there's, a, there's a very few like Dan select one. guys. Um, so like I hold, my whole goal was to coach pro. So I coached a bunch of just divisional teams. Um, oh, I got my big Joey... break. Sorry, Pat. Did Joey, Joey Blue, Blue ever play bro? That's a good question. You'll yeah. have to ask him that. You'll have to ask I don't him that think question. so. Yeah. I don't think so. That's... Yeah. You should ask. Oh, him he'll say, question. yeah. <laughs> that's that's between yeah okay that's funny i don't um, remember joey ever playing 
Um, I know Joey was in a strange nice. camp for a while back when they played 10 man. So I don't know what, uh, when okay. he was there or not. Um, oh, so yeah. gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. There's some, there's some questions about, <laughs> nice. you guys all know, you have been around the game for a long time. Uh, there's definitely, uh, some interesting between 2000 and 2010, uh, the term pro is very lightly used depending on what league you were in. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, um, I Got coached, the pro card, so baby. I co- Hey, if he so was I, in the NPPL pro, then that's pro to me. Hey, I'm not, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I, I started coaching uh, division four, um, worked my way up. Um, one of the biggest people that probably helped me along my way was uh, Paul Richards, who uh, unfortunately passed away. Um, coach Paul Legend. was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I got to, uh, I got to, hang, he used to let me come to damage practices and hang out with him. Um, and I learned so much from him, the way that he looked at the game, he broke it down. Um, it was, a, it was an amazing experience. Um, I owe him more yeah. than anything. Um, so I did that. Um, I quickly moved to the Carolinas because I was living in Florida at the time. I moved to the Carolinas for work. Um, so my big break was with a team called Absolute Chaos ran by Amy Webb. Um, she built a team here in the Carolinas. Um, we, in 2014, we ran the league. We appeared in three of the four finals in division three. We won Chicago, won world cup. Um, and after that, I want, knew I wanted to make the jump to pro. And at the time damage went through their whole, like, um, falling apart. And I reached out to uh, yeah. Jason Edwards at the time. And I asked, and he told me, no, and then I asked again after they got like beat up a few times and he finally told me he would meet with me. So that's what it takes to get in the league. I actually showed up um, to, um, uh, what was that paintball park in Georgia? Oh my gosh, I can't believe I remember this. Uh, Mo ran it, um, Nitro Paintball in Georgia. I showed up there to meet with, jo- meet with Jason and a couple of the guys from the team and I had built together a paintball resume. So uh, it was kind of entertaining and like all the stuff that I had done in paintball. And like gave him a whole presentation of why I should coach pro because that's what I wanted to do Uh, because I come from the business world. I think presentations are how it should be. Um, I think everybody got more of a kick out of it than anything. Um, And so I went pro in December of 2015 with Damage and I coached them from 2016 until 2019. And then we did this really weird flip. Um, I went to Revo. Matt Sossman, who was coaching Revo, went to Mutiny. And Joey Blute, who was coaching Mutiny, went to Damage. So we, uh, we just like made this like trade real quick. Three-way trade, baby. Yeah. yeah. Uh, didn't happen <laughs> Three exactly team trade. that fast, but like we've all joked about it. That was kind of like the turn. So I went to Revo in 2020. Yeah. And then I was at Revo um, for two years and then I retired this fall. And then uh, Todd called me. You thought. And Todd called me. Yeah, I thought. And then, um, and then Todd showed up at my house in South Carolina and then he decided he would just ask my wife because that was a better way to get me to be on the team. And that's how I ended up with uh, Houston. <laughs> um, so going back to your original question. We're about so Revo, damn happy to have you. Dude. Yeah. I, You're the I man. Randy Pat. Is an, Randy's an amazing owner. All the guys on the team are great. Um, the dudes, the guys in Pit, the Pittsburgh guys I've known for a long time. Um, when I got on damage, um, Tim had just joined the team and uh, Tim and I became very close o- over the years. Tim actually helped get me on Revo. Um, it was, uh, wow. it was a really interesting experience. Um, cause I wanted after the damage ended, I wanted to, to prove that I could continue to coach pro. Um, because as you guys know, Hell if, yeah. if you win, it's never what you said to do. And if you lose, it was completely your fault. Um, so I wanted to do it again. And players so can make or break own. a coach. Yes, they can. I tell you right now, I've, uh, I've yeah. been, I've been fortunate <laughs> enough to have some of the best players in the world. And uh, some of the most challenging players in the world. So, um, <laughs> but going back to your original question with Revo, well, you're damn, um, yeah, damn go ahead, good at me. what you do, man. Like seriously, I appreciate um, it. what you provide to an organization is is uh, an absolute necessity as we move forward into the high level of paintball processing. As we see it, you know, you gotta have um, numbers, you gotta have data, you gotta be looking at film, you gotta be looking at all the intricacies so that you can give yourself those advantages when they matter the most. And, uh, it's, it's been really cool to watch you work. So thank you. I know all the heat guys saying thank you. And, uh, we just love having you a part of the program, man. I definitely love, love being a part of the program. Um, I, I Dude. love heat. It's, it's a great experience. Um, you know, it feels like family, you know, uh, R- Randy and mama D do an amazing job. 
um, you know, my wife tags along with me and, you know, that everybody's taken her in and it's been, it's been awesome. Um, oh, that's so, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we definitely, uh, definitely enjoy it. Um, but going back to Revo, um, I joined Revo in early 2020. Um, it was an interesting team. Uh, Revo was in an interesting place. They were on the verge of being good, but they had no like captain at the helm. And it wasn't just not in the, in the coaching role, but it was also in like the player role. Henry is a phenomenal player and he is a great manager. Um, but he didn't have the captain abilities around him because you had so many big personalities, right? You know, you had Matt Derula, um, Zupa, uh, Dan Zaleski, Josh Pike, you know, these guys, Matt, uh, you know, uh, Max was on the team still at that point. Uh, so like we went to the first event, um, my, the way that I did things was definitely a lot different than I think uh, Noel had done it before. Or Matt had done it before that. I mean, the first event we came out, we got fourth place and then unfortunately COVID hit and it was a little bit of a grind for us. We actually ended up doing was um, live long paintball in New Jersey, ran open seven man events and we played two of those events. Long live, long live, long live. That's it. Yeah. That place is yeah. awesome. <laughs> I only know cause I go out to LLP. It is awesome. Yeah. He's got a, they have a, a great facility out there. Yeah. So during COVID they ran seven man events and that's how we kind of continue to bond as a team. Um, and then, you know, we went to World Cup. Uh, we lost the Dynasty in like a one point match. So you guys, I think, uh, so we, we did that. Yeah. But we knocked out Heat. That was our that was our thing. So I uh, I messed with Randy about this, and I know Tyler. We've all laughed about it. But I have since when I was on Revo, I knocked Heat out of almost every single tournament. That was like my goal. Like, how do we knock the best players out? And that's what I was trying to do constantly. And I had like Stephen Omar is a phenomenal like like. It looks like he's organized chaos, but it is 100% organized what he's doing out there. Um, and that was our goal is to go out there and knock out the best teams, find the weak points in the teams and knock them out. Um, so I definitely enjoyed my time with Revo. Um, I was happy to end my career with Revo. Um, a lot of those guys are still my friends. I, I've actually missed a call from Henry since we've been sitting here. Um, but I, no uh, way. <laughs> I, had a, I, had a, I had a great time. Um, I really, really enjoyed being with those guys. Yeah, that that 2020 Vegas too. You guys knocked us out of Sunday. We were the team that, yes. that uh, you guys beat to move on to that final four match. You guys are playing really well. Yeah, we knocked really out really good, solid team paintball. Yeah, we knocked out Heat. Then we knocked you guys out, and then we lost to um, I forget who we lost. Oh, Iron Man, who we beat in the prelims, which is ridiculous. So, yeah, oh, that's right. That prelim game was insane too, because you guys didn't you finish it the next morning. Yeah, we had to finish the next one. So actually, I'll tell you this. I, 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 me and Todd joke about this all the time. So it was so dark out that the night we were, um, Stephen asked me what to do. And I said, here's the plan, guys. I go, we're just going to break out. I had Max go to the little cake on the, on the Dorito side and shoot across. I had um, Frank just run out to the Doritos. I think I had Matt go to a can shooting heads up. And I had Zupa or Dan, I forget who was there. I think it was Zupa just like run to the corner shooting. And then I told Steve, I'm like, listen, nobody can see you. All the refs, that's when the um, Bunker Kings had given all the refs the new mass. And they all came with, with tinted lenses. And this yeah. is something I want to emphasize to people at home, uh, which <laughs> we'll definitely touch on. You got to look at the field of play and then look at the rule book. Okay. So this was a field of play moment. I'm like, listen, nobody can see us. I'm like, Steven, just run through and shoot everybody. He's like, what if I get shot? I'm like, just keep running. Nobody's going to figure it out. By the time you get there, just run off the field. If you rewatch that match, Steven literally just goes off the box shooting, stops a little like at the first, there was a, a wedge in the middle. And then he just runs through every point. Todd was flipping out because he knew I said, was just sending it through. <laughs> Steven would come off with like 25 hits on him. I'd be like, what happened? He'd be like, I got four guys. I'm like, good job, Steven. Run it again. Clean him up. And so they finally convinced Jeez. the league to, they finally convinced the league to, uh, to stop it. I don't remember. I think that back there was a lot seven, of cheating going on. <laughs> there was a lot of cheating going on. Um, because once again, I'm playing the game as it lays. It's like golf, right? You play the ball where it play lays. The game. It's fine. That's it. So, you know, um, I don't remember if the mercy rule was seven at that time or still or six if they'd moved it. But whatever, we came one short of the mercy and they stopped the match. And I remember looking at, at Jason and I'm like, hey, man, we just need one more. And he's like, no. So we had to play him in the morning. In the morning, Todd, obviously, the plan of just running through the field aimlessly did not work anymore. Um, they ended up coming back. I think we only won like seven, five yeah. or something. 
<laughs> so they came back and beat us up pretty good, but we just had enough <laughs> points to to not lose the match. So, um, oh my yeah, that, that was, was a crazy one. I remember that. Was that Farmer Far- 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 came full circle Sunday. Yes, it did. Farmer came full circle Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I watched them run the afternoon. exact same play that we were running for the tournament, which had made us successful. We had beat Heat. We had beat Dynasty with, you know. And I watched – I literally watched – A-Rod was shooting yeah. to the back center, and I watched him kick out to the to the side to go to that cake. And I watched him do exactly what Max was doing, and I'm like, oh, they're running our same play. I'm like, I hope this works out. And obviously it didn't work out. We got a major about halfway through the point. Steven got a, a major penalty. We had to start three on five, and then we just got just got wiped out. I think we lost like 6-3 or something was the final so um but it's still a solid solid showing and that that just goes to show you know like the effort that you guys were putting in and and the coaching staff absolutely yeah the players put a lot of effort in we knew what we were doing we had a great we had a great team we had great chemistry um i uh you know it feels it it, you know we got while i was on the team i think we got two fourth places um we never cracked the top three so for me to see the guys crack the top three this last event in Philly, you know, it um, even though I'm not on the team anymore, it does mean a lot. I feel that I contributed a lot to help them get to the position they are to be able to make that move. Um, and it's it's great to see. So totally. I'm, I'm you know I'm really happy for those guys when they're able to get into that top three position and and really show what they have. What do you think about so, all the shakeups that went down? You know, obviously you had. Uh... The whole Latin Saints impact, Revo move to impact, um, all that that wildness that happened a couple months ago. So uh, once again, I think this would take another show because I have very strong opinions about yeah. this. <laughs> um, I yeah. oh hit us. Here's with the, it. <laughs> here's the problem with the league, right? Is that if contracts are issued, the league should enforce the contracts, even if there's no financial enforcement. You sign a contract, you sign your own warrant, you live out that contract, no matter what it is. It's what it is in the real world. If you want out of the contract, sue or appeal. They should have been appeals to the league, and the league should have voted. Agree with so, that for sure. I just so I don't I think there were contracts between that. That see, that's the thing is. Um, so uh, yeah, we don't know because there's nothing issued to the league. I think contracts should be issued to the league. There should be a holdings, right. and the league should handle yeah. those contracts. And all the league should do is not have any legality to it. It just enforce the contract as written. So if you don't have stipulations to get out, you take all your money up front and that's, it's a year long contract and the team is no longer in existence or you don't want to participate anymore. Then you sit out. The NFL does it every day. So does the MLB, the NHL, major league soccer. I, I don't think, um, I think it, yeah, again, it, these, it, these players get paid though, right? That's a it's a tough thing. Like to to you know, let's take a a player on level. We'll just use them. So they're the most recent. A player on level, for example, it's a, a athlete that has worked their whole way up to you know their whole whole life essentially to be a professional paintball player. They finally do turn pro on level. They have one event. They don't get. They're not getting paid. And a team like Impact or Heat. Um, or dynasty come along and say, Hey, we're actually going to offer you 30 grand a year to come play for us, but you got to come now. Um, we need you this season and you're in a contract from a team that you get nothing or actually even worse, you are paying part your way to go to an event. How do you, how do you, how do you make it mandatory for every team and every player to have contracts when there's still players paying to play? Okay. So, um, you brought up a good point, and here's my counter to it. If you have a contract and you sign said contract, right, and you don't have a clause that you can get out of that contract, then you made a bad business decision. You cannot punish the league for okay. your bad business decision. You should be able to have a contract. If you're not getting paid and you say, hey, I'm contract. So a contract has to be an exchanging of goods. If there's no exchanging of goods, then there is no contract. So writing a contract it, for level. Exactly. So the contracts would only be based on players that have the contracts are getting an exchange of goods or some type of commodity has been given to them. So you couldn't use the example of like, I can't be on the ML Kings and pay my way and not be allowed to be released. That's, that's, you can't do that. There's no court in the United States okay. that would uphold that. Yeah, that's fair. No, that's, so, fair. that's what I thought you were saying. So, yeah. No, no. So it, it would be for guys that have contracts. 
Like I imagine that you have an arrangement. Guys that get paid. Does. I, I have an arrangement. Like everybody yeah. on Heat, um, all the big teams all have a all have contracts. Players that are being compensated. That's right. <clears throat> and compensation yeah. doesn't have to be pay. It can be uh, in goods or in trade, whatever it is. But you have to um, uphold those. And I think the league should hold the contracts and hold those players to them. And if there, there, there is clauses to get out, like if you're, if you're a smart person, you're going to put a clause to get yourself out of the contract. You know, if somebody doesn't uphold their end or something like that, or if the team folds, but the contract needs to dictate that. Um, and if you make a bad business deal, mm -hmm. like if you go to the bank and you buy a house, right? And you don't pay the mortgage on the house. What happens to the house? Gone. Gone. See ya. Right? Because you made a bad deal. So if you make a bad deal in this league, guess what? doesn't matter. You can just go somewhere else. And then when outside sponsors look in, they're like, hey, why did that guy leave that team? Because the sponsor may want to get involved in that team because of that player. Because of your point, Marcelo, people want to know the players. That's what they're watching for is the individual players. So yeah, if that course. player then walks away and the investment was made on that team, then why is their investment still worth? Should they be allowed to come after us for retribution? Yeah, absolutely. That's so that's, that's kind problem. of a similar conversation of of the league having some rights to the teams as well, so that outside yes. sponsors know that they can, you know, use use those that likeness for marketing, etc. That's right, because if the likeness changes, <laughs> yeah, a, then they didn't purchase the right thing. So if somebody went out the Latin King or Latin Saint Latin Saints, right? Yeah, Latin Saints. That was the new team, right? What mm -hmm. happens if a major sponsor would have came in, like, let's just say Amazon was like, oh man, we're getting involved with these guys because we have Marcelo, they've got the, or I mean, they had, um, who was it, Mouse and J Rab and all those dudes and all these big names. And then all of a sudden those guys just left. And then Amazon came and sued us, like, like, and didn't get involved anymore and banned us. Like, big marketing companies like that, people don't realize, like, if we get into some of these big deals and we do something wrong, that's a tough situation. That's a whole, that's a whole other conversation. I understand that. But, but that's the thing is like when we're trying to market ourselves, to because in that people, situation, it was the team. It was the team. But if what happens, okay. So Marcelo, what happens? They say it is an Amazon, right? And in, and in retaliation, they take all paintball products off their website. How bad does that hurt our industry? No, totally. I'm not disagreeing. I'm saying that, 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 brings up another point uh the league should have a responsibility as well of like what what pro teams you allow in you know there should be there has to be some right. sort of a, a better so, vetting process in that yeah and i know i'm probably this this is probably gonna be a really good podcast people are probably gonna like really uh really go after me for some of this stuff that's okay <laughs> um i like i you know you know i already retired <laughs> once so i'm good i'm fine let it rip um yeah so yeah. i think <clears throat> that when you issue contracts to oh, players that. There should be a holdings account that handles the actual money. So a percentage of the contract should be paid into a singular account that is then divvied back out. So let's say that you guys have you guys have contracts for twenty thousand dollars, right? The league will have a holdings company, and the requirement is your franchises must pay fifty percent of that money into that holdings account. So then they protect the player, and they protect the league's investment on the team. Because if your team already has the money, I like that. What is wrong with it holding it? Plus, if you go from a business perspective, if every hold say, let's say we hold a half million dollars in contracts, right? The league's actually going to make interest off that money and then draw another stream of revenue. Hmm. It's not a bad idea at all. So, but that's there's ways to there's ways to facilitate around all of these issues. The problem is, is that we all have to decide that we're professionals and we have to buy into the concept because our cells are not completely bought in. You two are bought in. You two are doing a phenomenal job. What you guys are doing is amazing. That's why I spend money to be part of your organization, right? Because I believe in what you guys are doing and I think it's a phenomenal for the sport. But the average person Dude, is not buying it. We appreciate in. you, Pat. The average pro is not buying it. Absolutely. In. Well, thank you, Todd. But that's the that's the issue yeah. at hand. Everybody has to buy in at some level to make this work. Um, it's a business at the mm -hmm. end of the day. And if we're not going to buy into the business, Absolutely. then we shouldn't be employed here, whether we're getting paid or not paid. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think these are really uh, thought-provoking concepts that are definitely going to come to a head. Maybe it's 30 years, 40 years, 50, I don't know when, but at some point, you know, it maybe can't it's- can't be that long. Maybe it's, it's uh, 10 years. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? But it, it's just, there is some uh, kernel of truth to it all. And, and in order for the entire package, like we always talk about, you know, making this amazing package come to life- um, I don't, you know, obviously we're in the infantile stages still of this whole entire sport. Um, we have so much groundwork to do just to, for even people of the the mass population of, of you know, society still doesn't know that Marcelo or myself or Pat exist. You know, they don't know that yeah. we run around on these symmetrical fields and shoot gelatin capsules all over the place and how, you know, and, and have this sport. But it's uh, it's definitely something that, as we move forward into time, I think is going to catch tremendous steam because it's too much damn fun and the youth love it. And it's uh, it's just a good sport all around for, for the community and for so many levels of like self progression as well. Um, as a person, as a part of like a tribe and just a community member, it's really good sport in that regard. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely still in the early stages and we'll have to, you know, keep pushing it forward. That's all you can do. Keep playing and keep, improvising to make it the best form of itself we can yeah for sure yeah I mean, what I you just said a... there ty about <clears throat> go ahead marcel sorry go go ahead pat i know there's a, no, li a little bit of a delay in the for, for the listener sorry um but uh I, what you just said there ty about um all the good things that your this sport does for us as individuals and why we've fallen in love with it, you know, the the type of growth that it has given us and the opportunities and the relationships, those are all the things that I think we said this in the in the GOAT meeting. Like I wish we did a better job of highlighting that, you know, not just the pro matches. Like the, yeah, the pro matches are important, but the stories and everyone compares it to the the F1 uh Netflix documentary. I actually haven't seen it yet. I've been meaning to watch it because I've I've heard a lot of comparisons is drawn good. as to how we can showcase what we do better but um it's the lifestyle that that we should be showcasing because just by doing that you're gonna you're going to generate fans you're gonna generate people that care about watching tyler oh if tyler's playing paintball even better i'm gonna watch tyler play paintball you know um people will care to turn on go sports if they understand us our lifestyle and things that they can relate to better um, you know, it's like the UFC did so well with the ultimate fighter show that, that, that show was huge for the UFC as a, as a business. And that's the, those are the kind of things that I think we could do a little more immediately without totally turning everything upside down and, and, you know, making crazy changes. I feel like that's a fairly that's easy, easy concept. To, <laughs> I don't know about, you got to send a film crew to practices like what, what Pat said, right? The, the got lower phone tier in my hand right here. Just pull it out, start recording, put it together. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's social media. That's a different thing though, right? I'm talking yeah. about, I'm talking, which you're right, Ty. Yes. Social media does do that as well. Like for, yeah. for teams, you know, if, if here, let's go really quick, just so I'm not, you know, uh, being biased here, DMG last place team uprising second to last Ironman are third. So you have Ironman uprising and DMG in the bottom three, right? Those three teams, if you're out there, on social media, doing your own stuff, it's going to help, of course. And like we said, the Ironmen, they do do that. They have a great following. They have, they have a lot of history too, though, right? It's not just from their social media. That team is a, is a championship, you know, pedigree kind of organization. Um, people are going to tune in to watch that. But I'm talking about like an actual production, right? Where Go Sports, and this is what Pat was saying, you know, they really do only follow the top teams. But maybe send a film crew for a weekend, you know, before a, an event to level. Especially they're kind of a little more on the rise now. Um, you know, send them to one of these teams that are really struggling. Maybe they have players on the team that are really likable. Maybe they have players on the team that that are that other paintball players are going to relate to and say, man, this guy's also trying to juggle three jobs. He barely slept Friday night because he was at work and he's at practice Saturday morning because he doesn't get paid to play. He's actually paying to go to this event and compete against, you know, all the best players in the world, some of which are being paid salary to do paintball full time. You know, you sell that story. Guess what? That uprising uh, Houston Heat game, you know, Friday morning, people are going to tune in because they want to watch 
that player that they relate to. And they're like, man, this poor guy, he doesn't just suck because he doesn't care. You know, I'm not saying anyone here sucks. I'm just saying like he, you know, he doesn't just suck because he doesn't care and doesn't show up. No, this player has a ton of stuff going on. This player has so much other stuff, but they're trying to follow something they truly love. This is their like passion because of, you know, so many X, Y, Z. I'm going to tune in to watch. You know, and say it harsh, but it just is what it is. You know, if if you're in that last place bracket, it's, but again, you know, sell those stories, sell that because it's relatable to people. It's relatable. You know, at the end of the day, that's what gets views is stuff that's relatable, stuff that people can say, "Hey, I kind of understand this. I feel this. I support this." Right? Yeah, I agree. That with came that. off a little wrong. You guys know what I mean. <laughs> we know what you mean. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> You, we just got to have more, more of it. Just take out the phone. If your team is, you know, doing some whatever, funny stuff off the field, cool stuff on the field, document that, record that, post it up. It all goes a tremendous distance. You can't even fathom how many eyes it hits just off of these little reels or your stories, you know. Um, yeah. So just doing any little bit that you can. Like I said, bust out the phone, take a couple clips, make a five minute video of of anything and those things really get a lot of traction because people just want to see not only, you know, what you're doing out there. They understand you play paintball. They've probably seen that, but all the in-between stuff as well. Yeah, 100 percent. I, I just want to see the sport grow. So, um, you know, my focus is the youth and that's where I'm sticking. Um, I, I like I like growing the bottom, yeah. you know, pushing up and uh, giving people the opportunity. It's it's a great time. So. You know, we'll have to make it where we can get one of you, both of you out at some point, come out to a URPL and make you guys coach a kids team and have the full experience. That would be, be amazing. Awesome. Yeah. So immediately, you know. immediately. And yeah. major love to the URPL with uh, Cash Money, Todd Martinez, everything that yes. you guys are doing, because it is tremendous. And we wish you guys nothing but success on that adventure that you guys are on with that. And uh, oh, yeah. from the PTG World Discord, uh, we got okay. Papa Sash. I want to do ask this one. He's saying, because you are the Houston Heat official offensive coordinator. What yes. does that even mean in paintball? He's wondering. Okay. So um, offensive coordinator. So my job is to analyze um, other teams and develop a game plan to help Todd, you know, who we need to put on the field and how we need to execute it. So depending on who we're playing, we look for um, – people breaking rules. We look for people the way they stack on the box. We look for which lanes are shooting. There's so many mechanics in paintball that it's hard for a single person to just consume all that information and then correctly be able to push it back out. And my job is to help take that information in, simplify it so Todd is able to consume it in a manner that he's able to quickly give it to the team and have them effectively execute on the plan. Yeah. Absolutely. And I do want to pick your brain on the uh, the start box because I think they might be doing some changes to it. I don't know. There's a lot of teams starting out of bounds off the break, um, you know, shooting off the break from out of bounds. And I know that was something that we saw a little more of like on Saturday, Sunday. Um, what's your thoughts on all that? So if you're going to have a rule in the rule book and you're not going to enforce the rule, then take it out of the rule book. That's pretty. Uh, lot so that so that layout, and I don't know if, if anybody plays the Philly layout, like at their local field or have a tournament on it. I will give you a suggestion right now. If you're looking at the field and the snake is on your left hand side, and you're standing at the start box, if you stand not even with the box, but just behind the box a little bit, maybe where your toes are touching the, where the out of bounds are, and you pull your, you can actually start with your gun in front of you and actually just yank it straight up, um, and you will shoot the guy going to the uh, the brick almost every time. Uh, that was the big problem that we had where people were standing out of bounds and they had their gun actually in front of them starting instead of behind them. Uh, we were able to identify that with some teams and we informed the league and the league took action to a point. Tattletales. Y'all are snitches. Uh, Y'all are as, snitches. Uh, you know what they say about snitches? You get second place. I guess that's what happens. Um, no, uh, yeah. No. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I that was a thing. That was a thing at the event. Um, yeah. I heard the buzz. I heard the buzz. People were were uh, complaining about people starting out of bounds. Um, yeah. So that was a but that was a big the rule stack. is you can start out of bounds. You just can't shoot out of bounds, right? And you can make no. as long as you're making rule. forward progress. 
Nope. Now the rule states you have to no, start what? in bounds. You cannot start out of bounds. Rule states you have to start in bounds. We have always been front. told that you could have one foot out of bounds. That's because the start box used to be used to be uh, on the center of the line, and now it's been moved to the front of the line. Hmm. I think and so. Like has that actually like changed in the rule book? Two. Yep, it's like four point uh, two or something. I forget off the top of my head. Yeah, and to my understanding, it's it's too consuming for the refs to be focused on that. I guess rather than the runners, you know, uh, actually going to spots and, and making sure that they're not being hit. That is a, so they want so to, that's, that's a, why they want to kind of change the whole thing. Yeah. So that's a philosophical, uh, I, yeah, issue. I think that that's so like going down that rabbit hole, uh-huh. uh, I'll probably get a text message from Jason Turgeon in about 18 seconds. Once this thing posts, uh, he'll be like, you're complaining about this again. I'm like, yeah, I am. Um, I just think if the rules are going to, if there are rules in place, the rules should be followed. If, if you're not going to follow the rules and take them out. Right. I do not care if, if we're allowed to start out of bounds sure. and we can pull our gun up and make forward progress, then do it. But if you're not, if you're going to put a rule in effect and then you're not going to impl- enforce the rule because you don't have enough employees, that that that's like totally. me working at McDonald's and be like, hey man, we were going to put the meat on your bun, but there was just no standing down. at that station. Yeah, so you just get two uh, two pieces Ice of cream machines cheese. done. Yeah, so I mean that's yeah, it's the whole like <laughs> yeah, no, I'm with the you. Whole argument, right? Yeah. Um, but there's, I, totally. I think for teams out there, there's, there's always advantages that you should look, you should always understand the rule book that's in front of you for your league. You should understand you know, um, how to apply that rule book in, in during a match so that you use it as a, as a, as a resource. That's what it's there for. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny, Pat, I could tell you're really detail oriented. I actually, I, I admire that about you. I think that's, um, um, something that a lot of people overlook is just all the small details. I know Tyler's the same. It's how, it's how I kind of approach everything. And, uh, the <laughs> brought up a funny thing in Dallas, you know, how they had the, uh, um, the sandbags or not the sandbags, but the, the weights to hold the bunkers in instead of the stakes. So they could kind of move around. Yes. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of like, so if people are starting out of balance, people are like, oh, what does it matter if there's one foot behind the line and you're going in? It actually makes a huge difference. Like if, if a difference. bunker moves a couple of inches, you know, there's a huge, there, that could open up a huge gap for mm-hmm. us to exploit. And uh, it's funny because I shout out to Maggie from the Discord, but she was um, talking to me while I was in Australia asking me, you know, oh, you know, how do you like the field? And I'm like, oh, the field's great, but I just hate these sandbags. And she didn't understand why. It's like, well, because players can move the bunkers and it changes the game. And she's like, talk about detail oriented. I mean, she's an attorney. She's a yeah. badass. She's like, oh, I'm going to go back and watch. She was watching the Dallas game. She's like, I, I don't see how this makes any difference. Like, what do you mean? I don't see the bunkers really moving. I'm like, you, you can't tell, but it's such the little details. You know, if you're in your bunker, for, for example, and, and, you know, uh, it starts to get tight. If you push into it a little bit and it moves up an inch, all of a sudden your whole back is getting roasted. You know, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know how to explain it, but that little bit makes a big difference. And so it certainly is not a small detail if players are starting out of bounds and getting an extra lane, you know, and your team is working around following the rules, right? And you can't get yes. the same shots. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's, it's, that's it's, the, it's a problem. It definitely is. It's a problem. But like I advocate to everybody out there, Go out and understand the rules of your league. Use those. Um, I think, like, uh, if you talk to uh, Jacob Edwards or um, or Jason, um, the most famous line I think I had when I was on damage. Uh, Tim and I were playing cornhole, and I beat him on a technicality. And Tim, literally to the day that he's gone, <laughs> would bring that up constantly. And if you if you talk to any of the guys on the team, and they're like technicality, they'll 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 know exactly what you're talking about. Because Tim was funny. pissed to the day. Because it was just uh, he he uh, I needed him just to throw the beanbag. What on the was thing, the technicality? I, I have to know. Uh, so he was gonna. Um, I oh. had enough points where if Tim threw the last bag on the actual wood, then he would um, he would lose. So I was just talking trash to him and it, keeping him distracted. He threw it. It landed. So he busted, and all I had to do was throw mine in the dirt, and I won. Oh, okay. And Tim had a gotcha. fit. I mean, gotcha. had, I remember we were at we were at Alex Spence's house. And I thought he was going to lose his mind. I was like, I'm going to get kicked off damage in my first season for pissing off Tim Montressor. I was like, this is it. This is the end of my career. That Tim, he never let it go. I think there's, a, there's actually a huge talking point here because the, the intricacies that we're talking about on the pro field are huge. The top players in the world know every single parameter and 
shot and angle and gap on the field. And so if you change one of those or a couple of those, or you're practicing, you know, here, practicing there, all these things are always changing. But as soon as we get to that pro field, and I know I see Marcelo out there, I see all the players out there. Marsh is usually talking to Trosen about how something's off a little bit by, you know, <laughs> here, there, you know. We saw and, each other at, this, yeah. at the last event. It was like, oh, Ty, look, it's, yeah. it's off a couple inches. And I was, I was <laughs> like, okay, you're right. And then we, yeah. we make those adjustments and, and the field is completely dialed in. And we know every aspect of that field. So to your point, Marcelo, ha- having a field that might have, you know, maybe not the most secure bunkers or things are moving a little bit, it does make a huge difference yeah, totally. in the longevity of an event, like as you progress through the tournament, especially yeah, when cause... players are shooting from out of bounds. Yeah. So just to clarify, so everybody can go home and read this because they're going to ask this question. Just a, it's just rule, a question because it real... – okay. It's, it's rule uh, 9.3.2. Okay. Just so – you go. Look, Marcelo's getting this. 9.3. No, so, uh, I, I'm not going to look it up. I totally believe you. But what's the rule? That's the rule that you have to be inbounds. So yeah, quick so question. I'm- was our team cuz I truly don't I truly don't know. I was playing the back center so I couldn't even exploit this one. Was our team starting out of bounds? I have no comment on that. Everybody <laughs> can go watch the game footage. Yeah, I didn't watch your guys' game so I don't know. Damn cheaters, yeah. dude. Who was on the who was on the tail? Let's see if I can pull up any photos. Damn cheaters. No, but I I think uh, uh it's it is interesting how they moved the center bunker because it didn't always used to be like that because now it's like a pile up like if you're starting in bounds and you're trying to get everybody positioned properly to make those shots that we know how to make off the break and get those angles it's more of a pile up and if you if you're not on like you kind of have to be on the edges and then like filter in a kind of because it it is tight back there now with it just being right on the line I do know the league is working on a solution. Um, Jason Trojan has a really good idea. I'm all for it. Um, I'm hoping that we're going to see it in Chicago, I think is the game plan. Um, but that league actually was, the league was very active about trying to fix it because it was such an issue. And it happened in Dallas, just like you said, right? It's happened at this event. So people are pushing the boundaries. And that's the difference between the pro division and the other divisions is we find the small things that change the game. It's the little oh, yeah. things that are actually going to mm-hmm. matter at the end of the day. And something that might seem like us being tattling on each other could be one of the biggest points to winning or losing that tournament. Um, bunkers being moved on the field, oh, totally. manipulation of the bunkers, just how far you can press them in. It, it makes a big, a big difference for people. And I, I, uh, if I can stress on to every divisional team out there, understand your rule book. And understand the ground that you're playing on. Just because you practiced on a field, which I think everybody knows this, doesn't mean the field you're going to play on is going to be the same field. You should walk every field that you approach, understand the shots, understand your responsibilities. And not just your responsibilities, but the responsibilities of the players in front of you and the players beside you. So that when you're able to go out there, you're able to execute Mm -hmm. on every job, not just your own job. Absolutely. Yeah, that's amazing advice. And also... You know, you've coached from the divisional ranks all the way into the pros, Pat, and I'm sure there's a ton of divisional teams out there and coaches and players that would love to have any insights that you could provide. Because obviously it's a completely different ballgame. And the pros, we see the same pros all the time. We, we kind of have, it's like, uh, you know, we have a really good insight on these fighters, say like MMA, these top two fighters, they watch each yeah. other all the time. They know all the intricate moves that they do. So it's a little bit different with the divisional. What is some good advice for teams to be able to, you know, place well and do well as an organization and as players playing in those divisional ranks. Okay, so one of the big thing I think is the practice. Okay, I think one of the biggest issues that that um, teams have is that local teams traditionally do not travel. So whoever is at their field is who they're going to practice, and what they'll do is they get in a rhythm where they're winning points, and they they convince themselves that that play is going to win them the tournament. Because who they're playing with inside of their realm yeah. is going to have to do it. But in the same instance, what you're talking about, Tyler, is that when we in the pro division, we know. I like I know what Marcel is going to do. I know how he's going to play. I have a general idea of what's going to happen with him. Okay. People in a local environment, they know how the local people are going to play. They know how the local people, their tendencies. And they start building game plans around those tendencies instead of around the um, actual game yeah. that's being played. Um, so one of the things that I did in divisionals and um, 
uh, I have a funny pro story to go along with this, is I show up to practice and I would write between 26 and 30 plays. And I remember with absolute chaos, when I joined the team, I showed up, I would print them a book, laminate it, have all the plays in it, what zones they were shooting, where they were going, if they were going to be delaying, if they were going to be running, if they were going to be shooting, just everything has happened. And then I would take that. I say, guys, we're going to run through 26 to 30 plays. Do not ask me to do anything else. And the reason is, is I'm, is by forcing them to do that, I'm creating creativity in their own minds. So when they get unleashed from those 26 plays, they're actually able, they're like, oh, when I was running to here, I know if I would have stopped here, I could have actually shot this guy. It starts bringing in more, I know it sounds counterproductive, but it actually creates creativity with divisional players because they're responsible to do a yeah. job that's already been set. And at the same time, they're also learning the field in various different ways. And what I like to do is I took those 20 or 30 plays. And then by the second day, we were down to 15 to 20. And by the third day, we were down to 10 to 15. And by the last day, we were down to six plays. And my goal was to go with that event with six plays. Six plays that I feel that we could win the tournament with. And I think people go to events only with one or two plays. And they're just like, this is how we're going to win this event. And it's not true. You've got to have something in the bag that comes out when the times are tough. Um, I, I, I think Revo was my best example with it because when I was on damage, we were all, we were doing well. We were always up. So we never really had to fight back, but on Revo, you can go back and watch tons of matches. I remember in Chicago, we were losing to, uh, I think impact like five to one or five to nothing or something. And we beat them six, five or seven, six, I forget. But like, you got to have something else in the tank that you can provide the players so that they can go out and execute. If you only come with two plays, you're, you're yeah. not going to get it done. Um, that's the big, that's the big, absolutely. The that's such a value. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then also understanding what people do. So tracking what your own team does, like, okay, Marcelo went to the back center three times. He went to the can here, you know, and understanding where everybody's playing and then being able to develop a thing. So if I look at a sheet, so, uh, I can't, I, I'll try to say as little as I can with giving as much information as I can. Okay, so Marcelo played, I think, like, uh, at the last event, I think you played 56 points, and 48 of them, you were in the back center, off the rip. Um, so knowing where Marcelo was going to go, and out of those points you played, I think you had, like, a 65% win rate. So, like, I knew you were going to survive 65% of the points I mean, if you were in that play. this on those sports. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, like... <laughs> when Todd and I talked about it, and this is what I recommend for teams, so you use it in reverse, right? So when Todd and I talk about it, we're like, okay, how do we get Marcelo to put his gun in and stop shooting at us, right? Well, we have to go short, have to have you know, um, have somebody step out and shoot back, which Tyler would step out and shoot up the gut, or we have Devin shoot the cross back through. Um, but in, I know I'm kind of getting a tangent here, but you need to look at that in reverse in the divisional level, and you need to find out where your players are yeah. going to start the game and finish the game, and who has the best survivability. Um, one thing that Coach Paul always taught me is that paintball is either plus one, minus one, or zero. Those are the only three scores that matter. It doesn't matter if you're up by seven or you're down by seven. It's just a plus one game, a minus one game, or a zero score game. That's all it always is. Um, so I think it's really important to understand where you're going to get the most productivity out of your team, not only off the break, but who survives the longest. I think survivability is one of the most underrated uh, points of the game, you know? If Chad George runs to the snake every time and everybody dies, but Chad survives and Chad's getting to the snake 80% of the time, and that means that we're winning at least that percentage, then I want Chad to go to the snake every time. Finding those, finding those tendencies within your own team will help you be able to better decide who the best five people are within that play. And they'll also help you decide who the best five people are over the tournament with all the plays that you have in your pocket. I just want to say that I think survivability is grossly underrated. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm with you on that. Like I, we, we've talked about that so much on the show. Give me five players that just can survive <laughs> for a long time and we'll make do. I promise you we'll make do. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 at some um, point, yeah. huh? You know, at some like, point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's the thing is you only have to be one over zero, right? So like that's 51%. So Henry Sense is a great example, right? And I know I'm picking on Henry because he called me during this call, so I'm just going to let him have it. Henry is not was not the best five the best five on on Revo, right? But Henry hung the flag more than anybody else. So statistically, if I put him in the game, he's going to hang the flag more times than the next player. 
which should give us the plus one. It's uh go back, it's uh go back to Billy Bean, right? And uh the Oakland A's. Okay. He didn't care about hitting, he just cared about on base percentage. Like that matters. Like the game has gotten so technical, like Marcel, you were saying before. It's not about the youth anymore, it's about the mental. So play a mental game. Find a way to get guys on base. Those guys are the ones that are gonna score. That's what you need in the game today. Mm-hmm. You don't need the fastest. And that's why mm-hmm. I think the ML Kings and like uh level ups doing so well is because they have that speed. They have kind of that old school, like we're playing like an 05, 06, 07, right? Those speedy kids or young, young guys that are just going gun, you know, guns blazing. But still, the strategic teams are still winning the tournaments. So correct. You can be yeah. fast as you want, but you just gotta get the guy on base. And that's that's all I care about. Um, it's putting the right people in the right places. And that's, that's what I provide. And as I think that's what divisional teams need to figure out and to figure that out, you've got to stat your own players at practice, because if you can, if you average divisional team, you coach divisional team ourselves for a long time. I think we averaged like maybe 50 to 70 points a weekend, right? I don't know what you guys to average. Yep. Um, but if you can take six, 50 to 70 right points of data yep. and you can, you can, turn that into an informational sheet and find out who your best five are based on survivability and based on productivity, you know, and that's, those are the biggest things. I like tracking a live off the break and survive the match. Those are the two things I think that are super important. Did you get to your spot alive and did you survive the point? Mm-hmm. And Pat is the man when it comes to, you know, this numbers game. So if you have any questions, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to answer them. If your organization is, you know, Having questions about something, Pat is just a genius when it comes to that kind of stuff. So um, he uh, he has this. You you got like this whole, uh, I guess, a program that you built, right? And uh, yeah, so and me and my business you're really intelligent when it comes to yeah yeah. So my my business partner uh, Mark Henley, who actually played on Trauma, um, um, him and I wrote it. Um, uh, Revo used to make the joke. Um, they used to ask me what the algorithm told us to do. That was the uh, that was the joke on the team. Uh, so, like, hey, what's the algorithm? Tell us. I, they'll still walk up to me today and ask me about how's the algorithm doing. Um, but yeah, so we wrote a, uh, we wrote a program hilarious. that that stats players and then takes in that data and then gives us kind of an outcome of what is most likely going to happen, so that we can understand wow. where people are at. Fascinating. How so do I how do I get that, my hands on this? Yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, that's definitely, uh, you know, I, I, uh, it. I, I approached Go Sports a few years ago. I was like, Hey, I got this thing. You guys should talk to me about it. And they're like, nah, I'm like, okay, cool. So we just kind of like walked away and did it. I'm just doing it. I've been doing it forever. It might now. be time involved. to talk to him again. I think, yeah, might be time to talk to him again though. Honestly, I feel like Bart is really open to all the new, uh, options and possibilities, opportunities, you know, anything to, uh, you know, make the show better. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe it could so, somewhat be integrated with fantasy paintball. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So it's actually funny. Um, so talking about that, you, you guys are going to get a kick out of this. So when I started it, um, I was on damage and it was physically taking sheets. And then we had a laptop in my SUV. And then Mark would wi- had Wi Fi the SUV with a printer. And we actually, and I know uh, Tyler has seen like, the printed <laughs> sheets. And so we do is we like scatter yeah. games and then run back to the truck and then I'd print them out. And then put them in folders, then run them back to the team, and then show them, like, hey, guys, here's what they did. That's how we started. And now it's a little bit wow. different. I actually carry a tablet, and it's all live, and um, I can record data as the match goes on. And then I feed that data to Todd to help, so Todd can help make better decisions. It's really getting the data. Todd is, I think, in my opinion, I think Todd's the best coach in the world. I really do. I've, I've been coaching for Shout out. Years. Let's go, So team. I think I, I, think might I be can be a little biased. That. He's good. I'm not. No, I'm not. Because I coached against Todd. I coached against SK, right? I coached against everybody. Like I was a head coach for seven years. So like I think I have the the right to uh to do that. I coached good teams, like damage, we we're always a top, you know, four team. Uh, you know, Revo was a, a top ten team, you know, all the time. So I think I honestly think Todd is uh the, the best coach in the world. And my goal is to give him information, give him simplified information that he's able to make better and quicker decisions. Um, and that's, I think that's super important. I think every team, um, I think, uh, who is it? Uh, who's impact have now? It's not, is it Matt Jackson, right? Which one's the brother, John? John, Which one's John it? is their like assistant coach. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and they're doing the same thing. They're, they're collecting data to give it to Dave so Dave can better process information. Yeah. I think that's the next, I know this is one of the PTG questions um, about staff. So, I mean, I'll just knock that one out. Um, yeah. Is that the staff, agree. Yeah. The, 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 the staff in paintball is growing, right? And the reason it's growing is it's becoming yes, more technical. I totally agree. Um, and once again, it goes back to what Marcelo said. This is a mental game now. We're all physically in shape. We know what we have to do out there, but the mental is what divides us, right? Um, I would say the paint, the paint, the people in the top 10 teams on average are paintball smarter than the teams on the bottom 10. I just, I just honestly believe that. And that's nothing against them, right? Yeah, for um, sure. So teams are now adding staff members to be able to better analyze data within the moment and be able to make decisions um, to help them be able to win. And that's, that's what it's coming down to. One guy cannot watch five players. That would be like one ref can watch all five. That's ridiculous. So, you know, and it's, and actually it's not five that I take that statement back. It was, it's, there's actually 10 guys on the field. You've got your, you've got your five and you got yeah. their five. There's a lot of information that you have to be able to collect in and one person can't do it. I don't think two can. Honestly, I think, um, and I know everybody jokes about the defensive coordinator, right? But I think paintball should have a head coach. They should have an offensive coach and they should have a defensive coach. So one team focuses on the team itself. And the offensive per, for, coordinator focuses on um, the execution of the plays. The defensive coordinator focuses on the um, the team itself and what it needs to do to stay alive, like putting the getting the best people available. And the head coach needs to make the final decision and put the action in, into play. Um, I think as we continue to progress, I think staffs will continue to grow, and that the um, and that paintball eventually get to the point where it's a three uh, three person staff. I, I think that's where we're trending towards. I love that. I, I totally agree too. It is funny. I, I see, you know, small pieces of that in like just within our team alone, you know, when we, the difference in opinion on how to play a point when we're trying to hold the team off for 60 seconds is wildly funny. And, and the players individual play style and how it attributes to that. So there's definitely like a certain mind that is, that leans more defensively and, and just kind of is able to see how to set that kind of stuff up a little bit better than a mind that maybe needs to win a point in 45 seconds. You know, it's, it's definitely, you see that dynamic and I totally agree. I think, um, you know, bring it back to Todd in 2020 when, when the Ironman won and he was the head coach of the Ironman. And it was like, how did the Ironman even win that event? Nobody saw that coming. Um, but they did. They also had a similar, they had extra staff, you know, shout out to Nikki. Yes. She's the head coach of the Ironman yep. now, but she was like all the analytics and she does a fantastic job. You know, that kind of stuff is, is seriously important. And I got to say, skinny Kevin does a great job to me. I feel like he does that job as well as his job. You know, he brings us great analytics stuff that you don't really see from a lot of the coaches and it helps the players. It certainly helps the coach if, if the coach doesn't have to do it. Right. Um, but it's to your point. I totally agree. I think that the staff is going to continue to grow and it's going to have to grow, right? You're going to, because we're paying more attention to different details and more details. We're adding more things that we're considering, you know, there's more stuff that we're, you know, in tune with now as, as to like why we're winning and losing these points, you know, why we're plus one, zero or negative one, right? There's, there's more variables coming into play. That's, you know, getting us to that result. So um, that's kind of exciting. It means there's more, uh, more opportunity for, for people in paintball in general, right? Yeah, yeah. no, I completely agree. Yeah, and Todd is such a beast, man. Yeah. Todd's, Todd, Todd knows what he's doing. I, uh, I, it's great working with yeah. Todd. I, I don't, I honestly don't know an organization that I would have came back to. Um, I think that, uh, I just, that he was a good match for myself, my family and the timing. Um, I'm happy to be there and, you know, happy to work along Todd, you know, we get to work doing coaching together and then we get to run the league together. So it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, it's I, amazing. I love it. Yeah, actually it's definitely a great time. I, uh, oh, it's the best man. And, uh, T money is a cornerstone in paintball. I was actually just, I had push on, I showed my, my, uh, seven year old kid. He's never seen push. So he watched push today. And I was telling him about all the people in the movie. I was like, there's my coach right there. That's Todd when he was younger. And, um, you know, several different players like uh, Rocky Cagnoni. He's a huge Rocky Cagnoni yeah. fan now. He's like, that's my favorite player. You know, he's jumping all over the place. And so it's just it's amazing that we still have so much heritage in paintball like SK, like, uh, you know, Todd Martinez. 
these players that um, really cut the paths for us to do what we do today and are still a huge pivotal part of this machine that is really catching steam and it's because of their minds too we have we still have all these amazing minds in the game um, from so many different levels in paintball so huge shout out to all the coaches the staff um, obviously the heat fam we have one of the greatest communities in paintball and the staff is second to none so um, it takes takes the whole organization and the whole family to make these things come to fruition and i know that Everyone sitting here knows that more than anybody. Um, and if your team is having trouble with those kinds of things, those are those are some things that Marcel always talks about, things you can control, you know, like take those things you can control, put them in your side. And that way you just have to focus on making sure that you're doing the best you can out there on that field. And then, uh, you know, all the details will be ironed out that way. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. <clears throat> Pat, we're going to hop back into some of these questions. I really like this one okay. from young Stevie. Uh, he says, hey, Patrick, as always, thank you for taking the time to do PTG. Uh, what is something unique to your brand of coaching that you always bring with you? A drill or team bonding activity that's always been a favorite of yours? Or if you answered already, is there a particular type of scouting that divisional players usually aren't aware of or doing efficiently? Yeah, I think, um, I think the scouting thing we've covered. Um, do I bring something different? Um, I don't know. Um, I guess my different thing is, uh, that's a hard, it's honestly a hard question. Um, I don't interact with the team much outside of the field and outside of responsibility. Um, I do a little bit of outside stuff, but most of the time I'm getting ready for meetings. Um, I, uh, I can yeah. suggest this. If you're going to go to an event, here's what you need to do. Uh, go to Amazon and buy yourself a projector. Tyler has now experienced a projector on many occasions. Um, every coach or team should have a projector that they can plug into a laptop and they can put the uh, screen on the board, like the field layout on the board, like on the wall. Um, and they need to have some type of device that they can draw on. Um, so we use a Surface Pro. Um, Tyler loves the ruler. The ruler definitely comes into play. So yep. it has a ruler in the app. So we actually can the angles. spin it, get the <laughs> angles. And uh, we, uh, it, it really helps eliminate arguments between the team because they're all convinced that they can shoot stuff that does not exist. Um, so I, I recommend when it comes, I guess my style is like um, team, uh, like uh, like bringing the team together for meetings um, and then bringing a professional setting to the meeting. I think that in paintball, like going back to our, our, our conversation earlier, um, if you want to be a professional, act like a professional. Um, I don't show up with a 11 by nine inch piece of paper that I draw on. I come with a projector. I come with a tablet that I can draw on. We go through different plays. We have it preset. So there's, I think we have 50 different plays we can draw on and interact with per day. So we can record all the data. Um, and that goes back to this, um, to scouting. Um, when we're at practice, I write every play down that Todd calls. I write down what happened in that play. I record that inside of the program. And then Ronnie does a good job of um, getting people to film practice because I'm a big advocate about filming practice. And um, I really don't care about who's bunkering who. I just want to see what happens. And then we actually go through. I know Tyler's smiling big now because he knows this one. We'll go through and we identify each and every play, what went right, what went wrong. And in the program, we can pull, um, like I can pull like what Tyler did for the entire day. And it shows me a map of everything that Tyler did, where he went what the percentage of survival was, the percentage of, um, did he make it there alive? Was he shooting? And then if he disagrees with something, um, we actually can go to a line item, figure out which one he disagrees with, then go to the video and then watch the whole video. Um, I think the best example I have with Heat so far is Fedorov was arguing with me about a kill count. And we actually were able to go back to the exact point, identify the problem, go to the video, and then show him that he was completely wrong. <laughs> he had no idea what was actually going on. Uh, we won the point, but he had no clue what was <laughs> happening. I think it was like kill five and Fedorov was convinced it was kill three. Um, and it's all about data collection. I mean, I, I can't emphasize it enough. Teams should collect as much data on themselves as possible because that's what makes you better. If you can get rid of the small things I love that. and just keep building towards something, you're always going to be a better team. Yeah. So I got I, I to gotta, I gotta I give a, a shout out real quick to D's on Doc. Yeah. I'm wearing the hat. He helps yeah. us out, out tremendously with uh, yes. putting the video together and everything. 
Yeah, I definitely, yeah, definitely he's appreciate on demand, him doing that. Yes, he's awesome. Yeah. Pat, who has the highest uh, win percentage in the league? Uh, overall, individually, like who are you looking at? Yeah, overall. Like you talking about a team or a as individual? as players? Not no 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 players players. What player has the highest win percentage? Randy's calling me right now. By the way. <laughs> oh uh, damn! <laughs> on the line. So, on the line. You better say Tyler. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> um. All right, hold on a second. Wouldn't be far off. Yeah. Get him on the line. Hey, Randy. Uh, no, sir. I'm actually uh, doing Smith a here. podcast with uh, Tyler and Marcelo right now. <laughs> okay, I will, sir. Randy! I'll talk to you later. Tyler says hi. Let's go, baby. <laughs> He's already gone. I say hi, too. Come on, now. What the I don't know hell? if he wants to hear from you. That's though, rude. Sir, Marcelo. Um, Listen, we have a good relationship ever since he came on the PTG show, okay? It's, you know, it's very cordial, very good. A lot of respect for Randy. That's my guy. Randy's okay, I'll have to I get got, him on the line just... sometime without you guys. <laughs> Not bad. Um, okay, so what was the question again? Because I got just completely distracted there. Ah, okay. For the for the third and final time. Just kidding. Um, who has what player individual has the best win percentage in the league? Ooh, I don't know the answer to that because that that is a uh, you're talking about a decade of information that I don't have. This year, um, okay. Let's about- go this year. Maybe you don't combine them. So do you have them event by event? Let's go Orlando and then Philly. If you have that. Um, trying to think of Philly. It was either your, I think it was either you or, or um, so are you asking for the overall, uh, I got to think about this because it's a very weighted question. I know it doesn't <laughs> seem like that to the viewers, but it, uh, yeah. There's a lot of factors in that, like points played, um, sure. like right. uh, first team points played, right? Um, I, I have to get back to you to be honest. I'm just I, I know I know you were extremely high. I just don't know if you were the one. Awesome. Because you yeah, beat shoot. us, so we there's seven my, points. My, there seven points we lost. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, it's what it is. My, my point, uh, honestly, is, is just that if you have that kind of data, the league should treat you like a freaking national treasure, and we should figure out how to have this data public, you know, after the events at least, you know, if, if these stats are, are you know, accurate and, and real, like, that's exciting stuff. I mean, it really is, you know, and there should be a way to, to bring this to the, to the public. Um, I mean, there, there should be, right? But also that's what makes it different like i think it should be public but also it's a skill set that i have and i am my services are being obtained to use that skill set to help a team succeed my social media is a skill set that i have and i don't see i was waiting for that i was waiting for that me yeah mandate me doing it because it's better for the sport (laughs) so i mean i was i was waiting yeah i was waiting for that one uh yeah, so that's that's an interesting question, right? Um, yeah, so then I, totally. I put it on the same premise. If, if I provide that data to the league, even if it's a financial compensation, like I, I, I go back to to the whole mandating something else to somebody else. Just because I have something that's good doesn't mean I have to give it out. I get it. You're, you're yeah. in the same boat. Yep. I mean, we're all in the I same boat. It's, it's totally what we want to commit to. Yep. Um, you know? I Dude, mean, that's I, like our whole thing with this show, right? T- t- Tyler and I come on here and share almost all the secrets. Honestly, we talk about, you know, some pretty, I know there's stuff that we hold on to within our personal teams when we're preparing for events, but as far as like stuff that most players won't get on a platform and publicly speak about Tyler and I give that away, you know, helping players get better and exciting teams and divisional players to, to, you know, pursue a professional career. Um, it's part of it. If you really care about the game and you want the game to grow, we have to do that, period. You know, if you want yeah, to be selfish I, and give yourself a little bit of a competitive edge, I have to respect that too, you know, I, and I, I understand that as well. Um, it's not my choice, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's it's one of those things, right? So it's a, it's a catch-22. It's like every conversation, 20 pro teams versus 12 pro totally. teams, forcing people to use social media, not forcing mm-hmm. people to use mm-hmm. it. Right, giving an advantage to not an advantage. Absolutely, um, uh, it's just one of those things that's out there. Well, it's and, earned. Um, you know, you, yeah. 
you clocked I spent, in. I, you've put in hours time. and hours of work. Yeah. I mean, it took me it to, took me to build ten. That. It took me ten years to go pro. Right? It just didn't happen overnight. It took ten years of coaching to go pro, and then it took me another few years to figure out what I wanted to have the program do. And then it took me and my business partner to actually sit down and spend hours and hours and hours building it. Um, should the community have it? Yeah, I think they should. I think at some point it should be something that's available out there. The data is super important. I've told Tom Cole, and, I, and Tom knows this, and I and I, I've said it. His, I've said I said it. I said it in uh, Orlando. I know more about the league than the league knows about itself when it comes to player reporting and data. Like I know that for a fact. The league hmm. wants to focus on things. Yeah, that's the stuff league they, wants, they need. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but the league wants to focus on stuff that doesn't matter. I do not care if Tyler shoots you four times, Marcelo. I don't. That mean it's meaningless to me, right? Because it doesn't actually affect the game as a whole. It's an individual situation within the game. If you still, if Mar if Tyler shoots you, if Tyler shoots you sixty times, right, and he's the 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 MVP of the most kills, right, but you hung the flag, kill count more, leader, yeah, then who, right. then you won the tournament. So who cares? But we focused on yeah, kill count leader. It it brings up. It brings up the conversation of what stats do you value most to to have, and I guess honestly that's a tough one because in sports that's always the conversation. Like, what makes you the best? Is it the amount of championships, or is it how many triple doubles you averaged, or how many points you you averaged? You know, or how many total? That's always the argument in sports, right? And so it's um I, I don't know that one is right or wrong, but I I personally I agree with you that it's you know about the wins and, and that kind of stuff versus kill count, because, you know, you could close your eyes and find yourself in a, in a three kill point, <laughs> you know, close your eyes, run down the field and, you know, and, and that can happen. Does that take a lot of skill and, and, uh, not, maybe not. Right. So, I mean, one of the things, and you still lose that, the point. Yeah. And one of the things that I, I have to say is like, um, when you look at professional sports, no matter what happens, no matter how well you do, right. If you lose the last game of the season, nobody gives a crap. Totally. Mm -hmm. It's totally. just what it is. Nobody cares. Who, I don't even know. Who, who'd you guys play at World Cup last year? I don't know. And I was there. Scouted the whole thing. I know about it. I don't remember. If you don't, if you don't. I mean, Come on. Honest, you know who we played at World Cup last year. I don't. Honestly, X I don't. Factor. I, I'm, I'm X, okay, X Factor. <laughs> but that's what yeah. I'm saying. Like, I don't, I don't yeah. know. Because like, it, it doesn't matter. We don't. You don't promote sure. second place. Yeah, I hear you. Right? So mm -hmm. if you don't win the last game of the season, nobody cares. Um, so Absolutely. That's that's right. I, I think it's, it's what stats you, you keep track of and how you implement them. But I hated the kill count thing. Hated it because it was worthless to me. You know? I, I bet you... If I you think were, it was just the easiest thing that they could do to... Yeah, easiest thing they can do to get stats back, right? In some form, it's the the easiest one. Well, maybe it's not the easiest. I guess it's I not. don't really points, know. It seems like easiest. it would be. You points know? plays the easiest. Points played. Uh, hey, Marcelo yeah, went on the sure. field thirty-five. But is times. that really? Yeah. It matters if you sure. won. I, that's a that's a cop out of a stat, though. You know, like you can't you can't do, do much you, with that. Really? How many times does the guy go to bat? They don't keep track of that. I don't follow baseball. It's pretty important. Every time they no go to clue. bat, they're keeping track of it. If you go to bat, it's a it's a stat, yeah. right? If you're in the game, yeah, if, but it, yeah, you, you got to start somewhere. I'm not saying it's not the a problem, stat, but like if that's yeah, 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 yeah I, I get what you're saying. My problem with the kill count thing is, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna let go of it after this is that how many players do you guys actually shoot straight up, and how many players do you guys bounce paintballs into? Let's talk about that stat. How many guys shoot bounce shots here? Wait, you I like bounce shots? Well, I, I'm just asking. My dude. Is it, My dude. Yeah, see, that's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Is, is, yeah. is, is, is yeah. how do you track yeah. a bounce shot? They just give credit to the person that's pointing their gun I would that imagine the same way you... Uh, I mean, uh, I personally you wouldn't. You know, I personally wouldn't. Uh, I, yeah, I personally wouldn't. Like, because I feel like... So this is a conversation with stats, right? I think if, they're, if you do have stat keepers, you have to teach them all the shots. That's, right. And so it would right. take a high level pro to, yeah, you have to teach them all the shots. And, and so then when they see positionally, okay, this person's here, there's this shot heads up, there's a bounce shot into that, you know, 
it would be very that's, difficult. It is. That's difficult. right. Um, and so, but um, up, yeah. So, so I want to give it. I'll give you. I'll give it uh, an example and then a reason. Okay. So in um, Atlantic City, 2017, um, I was coaching damage. We got second place. We lost to the Russians. Um, Matt Jarula went to the can on the on the snake side, and that snake was that weird snake with all the cut ends. You remember that? And Silos Cortez. Oh yeah, I was, do. Silos yeah. was the was the number five like kill count leader or some crazy number, right? I'm telling you right now, I started that entire tournament, and we taught me and me and Darula uh, talk about it every day. Today is actually his son's birthday, so happy birthday there. Um, Matt shot nice. every single happy one birthday. of those guys on a bounce shot, but all the credit was given to Silos because he was sitting in the snake pointing his gun cross field. I watched Matt bounce shot every single person out of that snake side of that field. Like every point, but they gave the credit to Silos. And that's the problem. And I agree with you, Marcelo. Without having the mind of a pro player, you can't actually get the data the correct way. So you have to simplify it into terms that people yeah, can understand and then start there and work your way up. So my business partner, Mark Henley, Mark played for trauma. And then he also was part of the PB Access crew. So he used to do statting for PB Access back in the day. And so that's why me and him disagreed with okay. them. Yep. And that's why we started doing our own thing. And then we built it up and that's what we, we went from there. Um, but yeah, bounce shots changed the oh, whole wow. concept. And I know that's a long conversation, but that's just the truth. If, if, if I'm shooting a bounce shot, but Tyler's pointing his marker that way, they're easily, somebody doesn't know what's going on. They're like, oh, Tyler shot him. And Tyler might just be looking around. So um, start with simple. Just getting lucky, baby. You know, just... Yeah, get lucky. <laughs> Um, no, I, so I think that, there's definitely something to it. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's just, it's just part of the yeah. game. Start with simple stuff. I think the most important things are without giving everything away is um, points played. Did they, what bunker they played? Did they shoot going there? Were they alive going there? And um, uh, survivability. I think that's all you need. I think you can base an entire. And how do you watch all this system. live? I, I sh it might be the way my brain works, but I have to, in order to like stat like that, because I personally stat like that. I don't actually write it down, but when I'm scouting, that's what I, so like I watch film and I'll literally press play and pause, pre play and pause, play and pause and get frames of like the body movements and what's going on in a breakout and a little hot tip. There's another secret we give away, but I, I can't just watch it through. If I just watch it through, I can't see everything that happened. I just can't, you know? So like, when, are you, they're live in the stands doing this all on your own. That seems crazy to me. Um, actually, I like to do it in the hotel because we have Go Sports, which I can thank them. I can sit in air conditioning okay. and watch it. Okay. Um, if there's an important right. match, I will stay at the field and handle the be at the field. Um, I know Tyler has seen it. It is Tyler can tell you it is very quick. Um, it's yeah, been built wow, out very yeah. well. I also can track Marcel. Just so you know, I can actually uh, I have a drop down for every team, and I can have all the rosters and all the team imp imported. So I actually can tell you what each player is doing, and then I can pull a report on each single player per match. That's fantastic. Or overall the tournament. Yeah, that's fantastic. So you bring a lot of value to to whatever organization you're with. Houston Heat is definitely lucky to have you. If if you're bringing that kind of detail and information, that's that's high level stuff that. Um, brings a ton of value you're right it, it allows the the not just the coach you know the players if they're really paying attention to that stuff they're going to make better decisions on the field right because you have more information about your opponent that's, that's right. uh, uh yeah it's it, awesome it, it's important information is the information is the key to success at the end of the day you know yeah. um yeah, that is it at least in my opinion you know every there's other coaches have other opinions but in mine that's what it is so love that yeah you, you and go we got a deep into couple that. more questions here Okay. From uh from the PTG Discord, I got to give a shout out. Randy text me. Shout out to Randy Smith, yes. Tomahawk baby, 100%. on the line. Yes, Let's right. go. <laughs> Let's go. Um, uh, all right, we got Aspina. He was uh, wondering your favorite part of creating the URPL, the most meaningful part of that, and um, what are the differences between the East Coast West Coast URPL? Okay, so. Uh, right off the bat, oh, the most also, meaningful. Sorry, shout out, shout out to PBC Greenville. He made sure to get that in there. I have to get in that that in there as well. Yeah. Let's go. Awesome, yeah. Um, so the um, um, the most rewarding thing is actually doing learn to play with kids that have never experienced paintball. That is the most rewarding thing. So my wife runs a children's business for the last eighteen years. Um, she has an immense amount of kids. It's a dance studio and a cheer gym. 
Um, and getting kids that have never been connected to paintball and having them show up and teaching them the game is the most rewarding experience that I could get out of the URPL. I love the adult league and those guys know it. I'll tell, I'll tell them straight up. I have a good time. I actually played in the league this season. Um, so it was my first time actually playing in my own league. Um, but the most rewarding is having kids that have never played paintball and showing them because birthday parties are cool and they're fun, right? But they don't actually show you. Um, you might have good refs and I'll give some yeah. shout outs like, uh, um, uh, I think it's a levy on paintball in, uh, New Orleans or uh, Baton Rouge. I think is where they're at. They do a phenomenal Levana? job. Levana, that's it. They do a phenomenal job of like getting people involved in the game and understanding what's going on. But a, a lot of fields out there, the owners just sell you paintballs, give you rental equipment and send you on your way with your 14 uh, year old ref. And you don't have the experience. Um, and, all, and, and watching kids learn how to like dive for the first time, how to sh break shoot. You know, I, I, I love just going over the bunker names with them. So we go through an entire clinic. We don't charge any money. It's free. I know Todd just did a big one out on the West coast. Um, and our goal is just to get kids that have never played the sport and to introduce it as a sport and not as a uh, birthday activity. I think that's the most rewarding, um, differences between the East yeah. coast and West coast. That's a good question. Um, Lots of guys, I, I have access. So we have um, group chats with all the teams and the East Coast teams definitely think they're better than the West Coast teams. Um, and figuring out oh, how boy. to get them together <laughs> sometime to fi figure that out is uh, definitely be interesting. Um, yeah. Our most successful team is my wife sponsors a team. Uh, they, it's the Southern Dance Connection. So they call themselves the dance team. Out of the five seasons that we've had, they've won four of the five seasons. So they are convinced oh, that wow. they're the best team in the league. Like, and they talk trash on the West coast all the time. They, uh, they, they want to figure out how to make up an East versus West thing so that they can, uh, they can play each other. That's awesome. <laughs> nice. So, yeah. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, sorry. I, I thought you were done. I was going to add to that with this next question. It, it uh, kind of piggybacks off that. Okay. What's the next question? Okay. Sorry. Didn't know if you're done. So from did it hurt? He says, what do you say to a player that's rushing their growth in this sport? Stop. Right. So it's from the new players. Stop. Stop. Learn the game. Actually understand right what you're doing. Uh, stay as low ranked as possible. Get forced right up by winning, not by playing higher divisions. Um, get outside of your realm. Like if you play in a, in a like a two field local area, Go to another field and start playing there once every couple months. You know, expand your horizons. Um, listen to what people have to say, even if they don't know what they're talking about, just so you understand. Like, like I think I think a lot of people in paintball want to tell you how it's done rather than actually listen to what's going on. Um, like for me, I'm like more of a I'm more of a quiet guy. Like when it comes to paintball, which is weird because in my real life I'm not. Um, but I like to take in what people have to say. And, um, and see what points or perspectives of the games that I can consume and use myself and then press that knowledge onto somebody else. Uh, I really think uh, divisional players get like, they're the best player in their field. And they're just like, yeah, I've got this on lock. Um, I'm a big advocate of traveling to practice, even at the divisional level. I think that's what made absolute chaos back in 2014. So good. We practiced, we traveled everywhere. We went to Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, like Amy Webb did a really good job of, if, of believing in that concept. And we won tournaments because we traveled and we went and played. We found teams that were better than us. Uh, we, our, our sparring partner used to be Rack City Clutch in Division Two, which most of those guys went pro. Uh, Mikey Waring was on that team. Rack City. Uh, uh, Rack City, yeah. man. Um, Alex Spence was on the team and then he went back pro again. Um, uh, tons of dudes were on that team. Uh, who was it? Um, uh, Elias Rodriguez that uh, was on damage for a while and now he's back on mutiny. He was on the team. So, I mean, like that's what you have to do. You have to go outside of your comfort zone to find somebody or find teams that you can practice. I think people just get too comfortable in their areas and they just think they're good in that area. Mm -hmm. hundred percent. Uh, yeah. Tremendous. Well said. That's a great answer. All right. This is my last question from PTG World. And thank you, everybody who taps in on these and puts the questions in the guest questions thread. Uh, we got Fab. He's wondering, for a player to be great, they have to have many important skills. But in your opinion, what is the most important attribute for a world-class 
offensive player. He just said that because, you know, you're the offensive yeah, coordinator, but just any player, I think, uh, in general. Uh, and mine is attitude. That's the one thing you need is attitude. How you approach the game, how you approach yourself, how you approach your teammates. Um, attitude is the most important thing. I think you can do, you can teach somebody to shoot better. You can teach somebody to run faster. You can do all of those things. But if you don't have the right attitude, you're never going to be successful in anything, whether it's paintball, life. Attitude is the most important thing I look for in a player. Absolutely, man. Love that too. Same page. Um, all right. Shoot. There's a, there's a few more good ones here. Um, from Step Decked. Everyone has heard about Dynasty's Dum Dum Squad. <laughs> if you had to label one for Houston Heat, who would be on it? <laughs> the Dum Dum. I'm not, a, I'm not familiar Me? with that. Term, yeah, yeah. So. Ronnie. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> So yep. the Dum Dum Squad is Blake Yarber is the captain. <laughs> uh, I think that kind of makes sense. Um, yeah. He axed his thumb off before the season started. Uh, you got Blake Yarber, Mike Urena, uh, Dalton is on the team, Arturo, and Damian. That is our Dum Dum Squad. Kyle is still kind of like in undecided on if he's going to be on the Smart Smart Squad. There's no Smart Smart Squad. We're just the other squad. The squad that lost to the Dum Dum Squad, actually, we they played us with their shirts off in practice uh, for one point at the end of the day, and they beat us. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's uh, uh. It, it's Skinny Kevin kind of labeled them the Dum Dums because they're uh, you know the Dum Dums of the squad. You know they they don't really need a game plan. They're just going to close their eyes and run at you and uh, try to slam dunk as many times as they can. Okay, so if I had to pick on my team, uh, it's definitely um, uh, Fedorov because. There's not a game plan in the world you can write <laughs> to that Federoff will participate in. Um, Sam, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, after that, it gets a little a little dicey because Mishka listens to everything you say. Tyler's a very respectful player. Um, Devin is yeah. is very respectful. <laughs> uh, ugh, Ryan's Bird's going to do what he's supposed to do. Maybe Moorhead and Chad's going to go exactly where you tell him. So like we're a little we're one guy short. Yeah. We're, we're yeah, one guy, one guy short. short. Maybe we're that's maybe short. that's the issue. You guys might need to pick up one more dum dum. Yeah, let me on there. Yeah, we. <laughs> Ty wants in. Yeah, that sounds like a fun squad. Yeah, I want to yeah, run. They're fun. One they're the fun stallion. for sure. It's uh, man. No matter how you slice it, we're all just a bunch of uh, characters having fun out there, and it is it is a dream come true. I can't even begin to exemplify how grateful I am for. I mean, these conversations for Houston Heat, for the entire pro organization and paintball as a whole, it's just, I mean, we're just the luckiest people ever that we get to be a part of this amazing world of sports and, you know, have fun and travel and build memories and win championships. And, you know, we're just, we're just so lucky. Yeah, I, I definitely Absolutely. agree with that. It's an amazing experience. Yeah, man. So. Truly. Appreciate it, man. Pat, thank you so much for uh, coming and hanging out with us. I think uh, we uh, we brought up a lot of good points and had some good conversation and some things. And so now the 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 real test is if we can implement any of the things that we discuss on here, right? So uh, we have to package some of these ideas up and and um, see if we can make them happen. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I'm so glad All to be on the All love for the show. game. All love for paintball. Yeah, I was glad to be on the show today. Um, you know, big fan of the, what you guys are doing. I'm definitely a supporter of it. You guys have got me. Um, man, if, uh, for everybody out there that's, that's listening to this in the future, like join the, join the discord, join this organization, this group of people, this community, it's amazing. I, uh, you will learn more here than you'll learn, I think anywhere else in just casual conversation. And I think it's super important. And uh, what you guys are doing for the sport's amazing. And I can never show the uh, amount of gratitude I have for you guys to do this. Dude, we yeah, love and appreciate lot, you, Pat. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, man. And yeah, the the Discord is lit. The people in there go to bat for each other, and they're always, you know, you got questions, you you got whatever. It's just paintball seven days a week, nonstop fun. So thank you for that shout out, and we cannot wait to see you soon. I uh, hope you and the fam yeah. are doing great, and uh, we'll always. chat with you very soon. All right, thank you guys. Peace, guys. All right, peace, Pat. All right, everybody. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Hope you guys enjoyed that one. There was so much great value to take away. 
Uh, really enjoyed debating with Pat. We'll have to have him on again here soon. There was a lot of conversations that we could have probably ran with for quite some time. Um, but I'm on a quick turnaround here. Supposed to head to England tomorrow. And um, anyway, thank you guys. We appreciate and love you. Uh, and truly are so grateful for all the support. As always, you can ho- head over to ptgpaintball.com. And if you would like to support the show, click the Patreon link. You'll get access to the Discord. And uh, we have everything on there. We have all of our shows, uh, video and audio. So you can find everything PTG related on the website. All right, everybody. As always, we will see you very soon. <laughs>